Hey, Visa. Nice to have you back, friend. Hey, Tashin. Thanks for having me. Uh, really proud of you for finishing your book. The last time we talked, you were like, there was this one, you were like, if I don't finish by the end of July, like, come uh, come bother me. <laughs> so I poked you in August and you're like, how's it going? Oh, you're like, still going at it. So yeah, really glad oh, you man. finished. Yeah, boy, that took, it took longer than I expected. But, you know, it's complicated when you, when you know that it's going to take longer than you expect and you try to come up with some kind of projection that feels optimistic, but you don't know what realistic is because you've never done it before. And yeah, it's been a challenge, but it's done. So it feels good. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. I actually had an internal bet with myself about, I just put out this music video with Zachary Hundley and it was mm -hmm. also taking much longer than expected. And I had like yeah. an internal bet, like, oh, which one, which one of us is going to finish first? So you beat us to the punch, uh, uh -huh. which is good. Uh, but anyway, um, one question I wanted to ask maybe uh, to start with talking about the book is, and I don't quite know how to frame this, but I think one of the things that's really interesting about the book and about your talking about introspection is like, and I, I don't know if this is your experience, but it seems to me like you kind of discovered introspection on your own and like have been sort of mm -hmm. self-taught and like mm -hmm. self-practiced. And of course you've drawn from influences from a lot of things, been inspired by many things, but it like, you know, for me, when I have done things with introspection, it's been like very much in a community of practice or like with a specific right. technique or tradition or guided or mentor or like friends that are also doing it. And it seems like this, it's really been kind of like a lone wolf sort of thing for you in a, in a, in a lot of ways. Um, does that right. description resonate? And if so, like what is that experience with introspection or like what been like for you or what, what is your journey with it been? I think that's true. I think for me, it probably all started with reading and for me reading was always a pretty solitary activity like both my parents read casually as well but we don't particularly discuss what we read so reading was always a very solitary activity for me and I always enjoyed it you know even as a child so it's it's interesting because when I was you know by the time I was like 10 maybe like it it would be pretty clear to most people that I would be described as an, as an extrovert as someone who's like talkative and chatty but um reading was always just a mainstay in my life and it was something that I loved very much you know it was very meaningful to me and I've always had a very rich inner world you know narrative in a dialogue with you know I'll be reading multiple books and I'll be imagining conversations between the authors and stuff like that and it's one of those things where, you know, it was my life. So I didn't think of it as anything unusual or strange. It just seemed completely normal to me. And I would go to the library every week, borrow a huge stack of books, I'd take my mom's library card and stuff. And it was only, I think, maybe in my like later teen years that I started to realize that, oh, not everybody reads as obsessively as I did. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, I remember as on the internet like uh I, I so when i first encountered the internet i said this before i thought of the internet as like a giant library and it it hurt my soul to realize that not everybody sees it the same way as like you know almost like the the library almost as like a church right and uh something to be treated with reverence and 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 love and i saw the internet as a super library and i, I approached it the same way you know kind of being this this happy nerd sharing ideas and stuff and I was uh, heartbroken to find that people were antagonistic and, and using it as a space to kind of just dump their angry feelings and stuff like that. And I mean, so not everyone's like that, but like discovering the, the, the range kind of surprised me and, and shocked me for a while. But, you know, I eventually kind of just focused on what I liked, which is just being a nerd and, and reading stuff. And um, I, did, I did move away from books for a while, I think. Probably in my, like when I was about 14, 15, when I was, you know, like after, after adolescence, uh, you know, you discover girls, right? Go through puberty, discover rock and roll music. And like the, the world sort of opened up to me. I think when you're a child, you don't really have a lot of power to do whatever you want. Like you're kind of constrained by living in adult life. Like we're living amongst parents or, and like teachers and stuff control your life. And so when I started to have more freedom to do whatever I wanted, like after school, uh, I guess for a while, I was more interested in living my life and, you know, watching anime, playing basketball than reading. But then, you know, eventually I kind of came back around. I find that I tend to go in cycles. Like I have periods of time where I get very, very immersed in doing a lot of reading. And this has helped 
up even into adulthood like um so when i was very very young i used to read a lot and then these days i feel like roughly once a year or so i tend to get into like these intense reading phases where i would just devour several books at a go and then after that i feel like i scratched that deep itch inside me in my brain stem somewhere maybe and and then i feel good and then i just want to have conversations and do my own thing write all those things yeah so in regarding introspection um it just it felt very natural for me like it was just a part of my process and i used and i started blogging and writing online pretty early on and that was just a part of my process like i would, I would always be talking with people and so my early friends I, i would say even in my early friend groups um i tended to connect with people who were similarly introspective or like inquisitive like just interested in you know i have this friend ming and he describes uh he 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 has this whole theory about how people who grow up mostly reading books have like different psyches and world views than people who grow up like on the playground like he, he that's the contrast he draws like either like literary or like social mm. and for me i i would say that yeah i i i would if i had to pick a a, a team like i'm kind of in the team of like very uh um, literary intellectual overthinky kind of uh, imagination driven sort of um style and i that's my home base like that's where i'm most comfortable like you know you can i you can leave me alone with a stack of books and some notepads and i i could entertain myself for years i think i mean i haven't really been in a situation where i've had to but i can i can do that yeah. mm. How would you say that doing activities of introspection came out of reading for you? Like, yeah. mm, I mean, I guess I I was uh, well. So early on, it just when when life wasn't yet you know in the way. I would say like in very early days of school, for example, like you could just show up at school and and coast along. Like I already read all of the subject matter. like during the holidays and stuff so school felt effortless so even in school i would be reading under the desks and stuff and so at that during that phase i think reading just felt like it was populating my inner landscape and and so that that can be a tricky thing to talk about with people who haven't done it like uh you know some of the people i've spoken to so i've i've gone on a podcast with igan robot and i think we are like minds on that front like we both just read a lot as kids and it it feels like even though we are from halfway across the planet we both feel like we have this shared sense of like there's all this mythology and all of this you know there are conventions across uh, genres and and there's just this there's something like a language of literature in general that if you haven't read much you may not have access to it as as well as people who do and the distinction between the two groups isn't something that's very discussed a lot because the people i think the people who are in each camp tend to associate primarily with people from the same camp so people don't really try make a lot of effort to try and understand and relate to people who have a completely different way of approaching the world and um what was your question again how how did that come into introspect how did reading lead to introspect because yeah, i can imagine like lots of people like i like the phrase they use like populating it like populating your inner world like there are lots of people that presumably just populate their inner world and like leave it at that it doesn't become um you know mm. emotional processing or um you know self understanding or like rewriting your stories or any of the things that you talk about in the book like it could just be a consumptive activity or something like that yeah that that's always strange to me because that implies that there's a kind of boundary between the stuff that people are con- quote unquote consuming and their sense of self whereas for me i feel like from the very beginning you know asking questions like who am i what's where do i belong in the world you know like so so to to answer those questions you need to know about your history right the history of nations the history of ethnicities history of gender history of just all the histories of all the things right like what is religion what are all the different religions like so i just i i guess so i my approach was very much curiosity driven like when i was going when i was in the library as a kid i'm like you know who, who, what are people right what 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 are cells in in the body and what are you know what is religion what is culture like i would i mean i don't know if i asked those specific questions in those terms it was more like this flipping through a bunch of books and like ooh you know space what what is space rockets you know where where do rockets go and that kind of thing how many bones are there in the body i don't know 216 like that that kind of thing so i was just 
always curious and I always related my curiosities to myself and to my experience and what I know. And so for me, reading has always been a very um, high, what's the right adjective to use? I was going to say high, high octane, but that's not quite right. High leverage is also not quite right. It's like highly consequential, I would say. Like, you know, every, everything has consequence. Like uh, there's a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson where he talks about uh, the discovery of like heavy elements being produced in stars in supernova. So when stars go supernova, they scatter their the phrase he uses the the enriched guts across the the galaxies, and then those those heavier elements form new stars and new planets. And so ultimately, you know, we figure out that we the elements that constitute our bodies come from stars and so we are literally stardust in that sense and and that means that when you look up at the night sky those stars might seem very far away but we are not separate from them you know we are made of the same stuff and that you know it creates an intimacy with the universe right with with stars and with things far away and that kind of thing i remember reading about it when i was like maybe 16 or so or 17 18 i don't know and it's just so profound it's so moving you know it's it's the bedrock of I guess what you could call it a kind of spirituality, a very DIY, you know, pieced together from facts and, and knowledge and literature and music and everything. And so I cannot, I struggle to imagine what it's like to, to watch movies and read books and, and not be doing that process of integrating it into yourself. So I, I, I've encountered people for whom there's some kind of barrier or boundary. And I guess that might be a consequence of how they were introduced to the subject matter like so maybe they started reading with the mindset of you know however people introduced it to them they were introduced to books as here is a bunch of words in a book and it's fun to read and you read it and you're like oh you know it's a bunch of fun stuff in a book whereas for me it's always been like you know it just felt obvious from the very beginning that books were written by people who were trying to translate their understanding of reality into books. So books have always been very, very sacred to me, very precious, very, it's like, you know, it's wisdom, knowledge. It's, it's not separate from the world. It is of the world, right? And so it's like, a, it's like a portal into reality rather than something distinct from it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I still, I still kind of struggle to understand people who, are, who don't see things that way. But mm -hmm. I've helped people who don't see it come around to seeing it the way I've seen it. But I haven't been able to do as good a job of, doing doing it the other way around where I, so I, I can try to imagine what it would be like if I didn't realize that everything's connected but you know it's difficult to to forget what you know mm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think how to ask this but well one of the themes in the book definitely was like journal about things like if there's a problem mm -hmm. that you have like write about it reflect about it uh, yeah. make it conscious and I'm, I want to talk about that, but I, um, I, I want to, the question I'm trying to ask is sort of like, it, so it seems like reading books was a really important part of this and like the basis and, and the, the way you held books. And it seems like there's sort of, but if you sort of like fast forward to the experience of you writing that book and being like, okay, here's all these strategies and like specific things you can do. I imagine that journaling was a part of it, but like what, mm -hmm. what kind of made that jump and like made it like, oh, there's this activity, introspection that I can do and I can get better at and that helps me with my life. And, oh, I actually want to write a book about it. Like what, what happened between like, oh, I read books as a kid. They were very meaningful to me. I always read, they impacted mm -hmm. me. They were alive for me. Like what, what brought you along that journey? Right. So, I mean, when I, so I said earlier that like, I didn't really discuss the books that I read with my parents or vice versa, but I wanted to, you know, I wanted to discuss what I, I read. And when I encountered the internet, the internet felt like a, dis a giant discussion forum. And in mm. initially I got into it discussing the video games that I was playing, but yeah, I'll just be looking for forums, looking for friends, looking for places to connect with people and share what's on my mind. And I started blogging and initially when I was blogging, it was uh, with, so I had a website. I just wanted to have a website, like some place on the web that's mine that I can kind of, I, like the earliest iterations of my website was just like my favorite, here are my favorite pictures, here are my favorite links to jokes and, and games and stuff. Like just welcome to my site. And then I started blogging uh, in primary school when I was like, 
10 or 11 and like several of my classmates were doing it so we th- this is like a proto facebook of sorts like before there was facebook we would all just blog and we would all read each other's blogs and it's all quite mundane it's like today i went to school and then after school i went to this guy's house and we played video games and it's, it's kind of just reporting on our daily life and mm-hmm. and some of it was like you know here my feel i'm feeling kind of sad and you know, i'm feeling stressed about this that and, and it's just a way of like expressing our feelings and, and communicating with one another and we'll be chatting on MSN and stuff. And so it just always felt very natural and organic to be just thinking out loud and sharing our thoughts with each other and commenting on each other's thoughts. And um, yeah, I just kept doing that. It felt good. And at some point I was blogging about like uh, local politics on some on live journal and that like kind of blew up in a small way. And at that time it felt huge. And I was like, whoa, you know, there's all these people who seem interested in what I have to say. So I did more of that and made it became more and more of a thing. And I was blogging about local politics for a few years. Uh, I, I wasn't very happy with how it turned out in the end. Like I, I sort of unin- unintentionally ended up being a bit of a like kind of controversy seeking sort of like I still I was, I was still me. If you read my old content, it's still obviously me. But like you know, um, I tried to write some stuff about like being measured and and kind of mature, sensible, blah blah blah. But that stuff wouldn't get that much traffic. And then the stuff where I'm like criticizing the government or pointing out you know, like logical inconsistencies and, and bad arguments and stuff like that stuff went super viral or it, for that scale at that time. Mm-hmm. And that felt really good because it felt like I was being validated and like people wanted to hear me and stuff. But the audience response was very thoughtless. Like it was just like people were just looking for stuff to get mad about. And I didn't like that. And so I walked away from that. But by that point, so at this point, I'm like 20 years old, I think. And by this point, like I have ex- a lot of bunch of experience, you know, just hanging out on forums, having conversations. I've witnessed like forum wars, flame wars, people <laughs> fighting. And I'm like, why are people fighting? You know, why can't we all get, just get along? You know, why are communities the way they are? All those things. And um, I don't know if I would, so even, even you know, I would, I would slightly push back or resist the idea that, you know, introspection is a thing. And it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, discipline that you have to get into in some way like i just think of it as it's it's an out it's a sketchy pencil outline around all the things that i do that make me happy that things that things that work for me so i never set out to specifically write a book about introspection until until quite recently you know so i used to blog just about whatever's on my mind a lot of uh scattered feelings and thoughts and and stuff and you know i just work through my problems i'd be curious like why am i why am i upset why am i frustrated with myself why am i not able to do the things that i say i want to do all of those things and yeah I, I so and that led to like uh and so when i stopped blogging about local politics i still wanted to write like i love writing and i knew that i'm good at it and i enjoy it so i wanted to do more of it so i started my thousand word vomit project which was really you know so it was introspective in the sense that i was writing about myself for myself but you know i wasn't like I am going to introspect now. It's like, no, I just want to write as much as I can. And I will write about what I know. And what I know is what I'm feeling. And so I did a bunch of that. And, you know, that went on for several years, hundreds and hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of, of words of me, fig- like just figuring myself out. And, you know, it worked. Like I got good at it. I got to know myself pretty well. I got to, I got, I became familiar with like my patterns and my problems and, and you know, what my triggers are, what stresses me out. And, you know, when, when am I doing well? When am I not, not doing well? And so uh, uh, when I got on Twitter, I mean, I had a Twitter account for some time, but like when, when Twitter started blowing up for me, uh, people would DM me about their problems. And because they would say things like, oh, you know, you sound like you have your shit together. You seem mm. pretty happy. You, like you seem well adjusted. Like I'm not like, how do I become like you? You know, I'm struggling with this. this. And I would ask them questions. You know, so it's kind of the same process, right? Like, so I, and by this time, so at this point, I'm like 28, 29. I've already spent a few years working for Dinesh. So if, if people watch the, the video of Dinesh, uh, he was my ex-boss and he was like a mentor figure who guided me through a bunch of stuff. So that, that you know, he was, in a sense, he, he informed my introspective process as well. And again, here, I just mean just thinking, right? Just thinking mm-hmm. about yourself, thinking about what's going on, thinking about what you want to do next and then doing stuff. And so he guided me as a mentor, as a boss, and I got pretty good at that. And uh, so when people asked me for help, I was actually able to help them. And I noticed over several months for like a dozen or so people or more, like people would come to me with their problems. I would talk them through it and they would get better. And they would like, you know, like I would see them become happier and they would thank me for it. They'd be like, oh, you know, I used to have this issue with my brother or I used to have this issue at work and now things are better. And I'm like, oh, wow. So if I can have this effect on some people, 
just by talking with them. Like, wouldn't it be, it suggests to me that I should probably be able to have this effect on more people, but if I can package it into something that I can share with a lot of people at once, instead of having, you know, conversations with one person at a time, which I still do, you know, I still enjoy doing it and I still uh, find it fruitful, both to help individual people one at a time and to learn from them about the kind of problems that they have and stuff like that. And yeah, each person that I've helped, you know, has kind of, they help me in turn to understand what people are going through and stuff like that. And so having done a bunch of that, I then wanted to write a book to scale that, right? To help more people, like help a thousand people if I can. And so I wrote the book and it seems to be working. Like I've been getting feedback from people who said, like most recently, the comment that really had my heart was someone saying that the book like sutured, like sewed up like a bunch of psychological wounds that they have. And that's exactly what I was hoping for. And so like a scary thing to try and, attempt right to do it's a bit arrogant it's a bit um scary as well like to so i'm effectively claiming to be a kind of psychic surgeon right which is which is scary stuff if you think about like people's minds are very intimate personal things like i don't think people should be flippant and and um like too casual or like you know like laissez-faire like you know lackadaisical about how you think about your own mind and how like who you allow access to your mind and whose thoughts about your mind you welcome into your mind, right? Like, like the random thoughts about pop culture or whatever. Yeah, it's no big deal. It's entertainment, right? But like things like your relationship with yourself, that's very intimate. And that's, it can be something that if it's dysfunctional, it's going to make your life very, very miserable. And if it's healthy, you can make your life a lot better and you can help make other people's lives better. So it's very, and you know, I'm thinking now about how, you know, when you're a ch- when I was a child or a teenager, like I felt like my, my life, didn't really matter. Like especially, I remember when I was most depressed when I was about 17 or so, like I just felt like life was so meaningless. I was just going to school, going through the motions and like nothing felt like it was of any consequence. And so I wanted to matter like in some, in, and, and you know, p- part of that is tricky because um, my internal feelings of insignificance and like I didn't matter and stuff was was being transmuted into this projection outwards. And, and that, that's a thing that I had to work through myself. Like it can, like, you know, in a drama of The Gifted Child, like El, uh, Alice Miller talks about how there's like this grandiosity and self-loathing that, that kind of comes together. Like it's mm. almost like a polarization that happens. And um, I had some of that. I did work through it. I got better at it. And I, I think I, I resolved it quite a bit. Oh, I'm in the process of resolving it. So it's not, not so bad. But um, yeah, where was I going with that? Um, the point of that being, I... I mean, I worked through my shit, you know, and I, and I, I know that I could help myself and I, I, I with some guidance from Dinesh and, you know, other authors and writers, artists, musicians, all those people. And so having done that work for myself, I, and then helping, having helped a few people with it, I then almost felt like it would be, you know, almost selfish for me to hoard all of that to myself. Like I, if, if it can help other people and the bottleneck between people being helped and not being helped is me being kind of like just stubborn about not going, not going the distance, writing the book and stuff like that. Then, I mean, that's, that's kind of my internal narrative, how I think about it. Like I can, I can kind of switch modes on thinking about it because you don't want to, you don't want to burden yourself with some kind of like, like, like heavy obligation where you then resent people because you feel like you're obliged to them. It should be, it should be a gift, right? Like if you, if you have received a kind of blessing and you can share that blessing without being, pushy about it right so I was just I was just talking to someone else about this I was saying like how you know um the tricky thing is you shouldn't be going around trying to fix people because if when you when you have that attitude of like oh you are broken and I will save you and I will fix you and I will heal you like that that reinforces that narrative or that relationship where like I am the savior and you are the damned and I'm gonna save like that's that's not healthy i think between persons it's more of like we're all in this together you know you have some skills i have some skills you have some perspectives i have some perspectives let's like share learn from each other and help each other out and like there's nothing you know fundamentally like deeply wrong or violated violation there's, there's there's no horrible kind of moral failure inside us which i find that a lot of people feel that they have whether they inherit it from family or, or school or peers or whatever like a lot of people have that very heavy burdensome crushing sense of uh, inadequacy and like you know it's i i and i did too and i've, I've found a way i've oh, through trial and error and testing and the support of my friends and dinesh and all those people like I've, I've kind of come through that and the difference in 
the how life feels like it's so dramatic it's like really goes it really feels like going from like some kind of hellish you know prison state where you're like really like life life felt like a prison for me at some point and now you know for the most part it feels like an adventure it's fun like i mean i'm i'm the captain of my own ship and i get to do whatever i want like even though i have constraints and challenges and bills to pay and all those things but i no longer feel like i'm i'm trapped in that and you know, I, I can help other people feel less trapped and, and that's a, such a lovely honor, right? To be able to, to do that for other people, right? It doesn't make me better than them. It just means that I, you know, like I'm, I'm privileged in some ways, you know, I, like this is my skill. Right? Everybody has something and this is mine. Yeah, yeah, it's what you have to offer. Um, I'm, I'm remembering one of the things you say in the book and, and I saw when you tweeted this originally, but you said like, one way you can look at the book is that it's a book you had to write to learn how to ask your friends for help. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, like, if you look back, how did you see things before such that you like weren't willing to ask for help or that was hard or something? And then like what shifted for you through writing yeah. the book? It's still hard. I'm still not great at asking <laughs> for help. I'm getting better. Like, I've gotten better. at like So there's multiple aspects to asking for help. And like there's like the technical aspect, which is like, I honestly think like if you're if you're like fairly smart, it's like actually the most um, it's the part that you can make the biggest difference in in the shortest amount of time. And, and that's really just learning how to craft the request of help. Right. Like so a specific request for like something that someone can do in a, in a like a small to medium amount of time, medium amount of effort. Like people people leap at the opportunity to help someone else if it doesn't, you know, like consume them like so the thing to avoid that some people haven't learned how to do is like don't go up to someone and be like i'm i'm in despair you know like everything's horrible i don't know what i need please save me like like you know because nobody wants everyone has their own troubles and everyone has their own responsibilities so nobody wants to be burdened with the responsibility of another person's entirety of their struggle their well-being and so on right but if someone comes along and you're like i'm having a rough day can you send me like some funny memes or can you just remind me of some fun that we had at some point or just tell me what you like or something and people love to do that they love to you know express regret they love to do something that then allows you to express gratitude to them and that's like the circle of life of, of human relations right like we're human beings and we love to help each other and um but that's so that's the easy part in my opinion for me right the hard part is recognizing that you need help in the first place because that that admission to yourself feels in, in the worldview that I inherited, it feels like weakness or it feels like neediness or it feels like, uh, you know, so I quoted Amanda Palmer in the book and she said something like, our like vulnerability kind of, our fear of being vulnerable points at our separation from each other. And, you know, this, like people have this anxiety about not being a freeloader, right? Not, not being, not exploiting other people, not coming across as an exploitative person or someone who has needs, which is silly, right? Like when, when you, when you talk about this in terms of other people, like, or even, you know, when you're looking at, like when my cat comes to me kind of wanting like scratches and, and nuzzles and stuff, like I don't see like, it's just it's obvious, like all living things have needs and it's fine to have needs like it's normal like that's very obvious when you're talking about other things but it can it can get less obvious when you're talking about yourself especially if you've inherited this sense that you're supposed to kind of pretend that you don't need anything and you're not you know not a needy person like you don't come across as a needy person and so there's there's this whole spectrum of articulating your needs in a way that you know, so ideally, if you're skilled and you're in a place of abundance and all of those things, then you can like express your needs from a place of strength and confidence. And people are like throwing themselves at their feet to give you what you want because they want to be associated with you and they want to feel good helping you and stuff. Whereas like, you know, if you don't have that and if you're like in a place of like scarcity and you just feel like you can't trust anyone and then it, like it can spiral into something really, really bad. And then people who have needs, they resent themselves for having needs, they resent other people for, you know, like withholding that thing that they want from them, which feels like, which when you're in that space of scarcity, it can feel like people are trying to screw you over or trying to just mess with you and, and like by not giving you what you need or what you want. And yeah, it's just understanding that landscape is, is tricky. 
and uh you know when you really see it you you, you it's quite natural to and if you're in a place of abund- relative abundance i think then you you feel the sense of compassion for what people are struggling with and you see how you know if the life in the realm of abundance and skill and asking for help and stuff is so beautiful and poetic and and you know it's flowers and 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 joy that anybody who can't inhabit that space like it seems so obvious to me that if they could they would because it's so obviously superior but they the reason they can't is because of all these blockers along the way so whether it's limiting beliefs you know uh, inability to trust inability to like just just bad history a sense of being disrespected diminished all of those things and yeah you know so i'm just describing you, you know you asked me about me and i just described like the general case for a lot of mm-hmm. for like and that itself is a kind of evasive but it, i mean I, so i'll just describe the landscape first and then i'll relate it back to myself right but if i didn't go on to relate it back to myself you see how that's like a, a diversionary sort of tactic but yeah so same thing i'm not while i can inhabit abundance in some ways uh I'm not like that in in all domains, right? There are there are domains in which I feel, you know, like uh. So I remember the times when when I was like a teenager and I wasn't very good with my friends. Like all of my friends, we were, you know, we were. I would say we had good hearts, but we were incompetent at at handling each other's feelings. Like we just didn't know how to talk. To, we inherited a very cruel language and just we were very harsh with each other and we, you know, we mocked each other and we called it love or affection right and it was just very messy very brutish very blunt and um you know that that does imprint on you somewhat and you just feel like oh you know like like so like at the simple simpler levels it's like you witness someone mocking someone else for having needs and it's it's very cruel and but like if you're simply witnessing that you then it imprints on you that oh if i express that i have needs i will be mocked for it you know i'll be insulted for it and when you articulate these things out loud and you verbalize them you write it down it looks silly right but when you haven't articulated these things and it's just a feeling in your gut or a feeling in the back of your neck or back of your shoulders or wherever you feel it uh, it feels very real it feels very you know it's a flinch it's a pre-conscious below the below the thoughtful mind kind of very collapsed awareness sort of state and you just flinch from asking the idea of asking for help when you feel so collapsed and and stressed and anxious you just feel like the associations you make with at that state to me that's what it feels like it feels like if i ask for help when i'm in this place of neediness it's going to come across as needy people are going to see me in like an ugly state and they're going to you know be disgusted with me or and it, again when i say it out loud it sounds so silly but it's the tricky thing is you have to say it out loud to see how silly it is if if you can and some people some people have to do some work before they can see that and they might not have the energy to do that work so it's really tricky it's like layers and layers upon it but yeah you know i i i know the way out right from that state and i was writing the book brought me back in you know like i i got to a place of scarcity while writing the book because it was so stressful and heavy for me but uh um, i do know the way out and i got the i got out again but just because i know the way out doesn't mean that i can always find my way out by myself immediately easily quickly right sometimes i just and the, the cool thing is now i have like a network of friends that i trust that if i'm in that place i might not be able to be super charming and super abundant and on all of those things but i can at least reach out to my close friends who i trust and i can be like yo i think i'm in a shitty place right now uh can can you help me out of it and i know that they will say sure because i've helped them out of their thing and so it, there's that mutual uh you know the sense of reciprocity and yeah so it's it's a work in progress you know it's really repatterning old habits old patterns of thought and like these things go deep they go far back and it's like it's really like a river bed that's worn into like your the, your landscape of your of your psyche ability it sort of yeah mm. sorry what what was the last thing you said my internet cut out there a, a debilitate sort of i said it would take years to rehabilitate uh, i see I you see. know just those old old habits and patterns of thinking yeah yeah that makes sense um it makes me wonder about like what it seems like a possible trap of this kind of thing would be like journaling and you like come to better self understanding and you like see the problem more clearly but it doesn't actually like that understanding doesn't translate to being able to get out of whatever trap you're in yeah so i i always say that the most important thing and i and i bring this up pretty early in the book as well it's like 
you should always prioritize taking action over anything else. So mm -hmm. it's like all the thinking that you do, the point of the thinking is to, to act, right? So like a lot of, I think people who are afraid of taking action, they feel like they need to accumulate as much information as possible so that they feel like they can make decisions with more context with all the information. But like all of the valuable context that you need is often behind the decision that you haven't made yet. It's like you need, you need to make a decision. You need to make a thing. You need to do something. You need to go somewhere. You need to, you need to get out of the state that you're currently in and go somewhere, do something. And then the new information that you get from that new context is the most precious and important information that you need to inform the next round of decision-making, right? So there has to be like an action and reflection cycle. It can't just be reflect, reflect, reflect. And like that, then you're just going to spiral. I, I mean, best case scenario, you just don't do anything and just kind of hanging out, which can be fine. You know, sometimes you just need to psych yourself up for a while, like before you jump off the the edge of the cliff or whatever but it's uh, important to remember that you know like like life has to be lived right like this is you have to make decisions you have to and even if you're going to decide not to decide like just so i talk about this as well like practice making decisions practice doing things going like you know go out try something new even like trivial things so if you feel like you're trapped in your life and like everything just feels like it's the same over and over again. Like just try doing something different in some inconsequential domain. Like go to a different cafe for, for lunch or go to, you know, just buy a different outfit and wear it and just go somewhere different. Like just feel, a, feel, feel what it's like to inhabit a different state than what you're familiar with. And once you do that, you're like, oh, you know, I can do things differently than I, I typically do them. And then it becomes easier to take any action, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talked to a certain point of, in the book when you started mentioning do 100 thing, you said like, oh, I didn't expect that this would resonate so much. And mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder what was the genesis of that particular talking point? And like, what was it the word vomits project or how, how yeah, did you it was, it? it was the word vomits project. Although I did, I did attempt a few experiments before the word vomits project. So like uh, when I was in national service in the military service, I was determined to kind of, uh, I, I had like a 90 week experiment where I just wanted to keep track of whatever, because I'm, I'm very bad with calendars and, and to-do lists and schedules and stuff. And so I was determined to kind of rehabilitate my relationship with that. So I'm like, I'm going to do an experiment of like 90 weeks. And that's just, you know, just having some kind of concrete um box right like i i I've, the idea of doing something indefinitely to me always felt kind of demoralizing because i like i mean intellectually i now know that the point of doing something indefinitely is that along the way you just integrate it into your existence and it's just the way it's just how you do things now and so you don't think about it like you know and like if you if you become like a cigarette smoker for example you don't think i'm smoking indefinitely you just think i'm going to smoke the next cigarette i'm going to smoke the next cigarette so you end up smoking indefinitely but it doesn't feel like smoking indefinitely and you switch that for like a healthy habit like you know exercise or whatever and you feel like oh no i have to go to the gym like for all time like, and no you don't you don't actually have to go to the gym for all time you just have to go to the next time and then mm -hmm. the next time again and then the next time again so it's like it's all these framing tricks right it's like it's just how, how we do perception and, and it's an interesting thing is that uh, what I just described the sense of oh no I have to do this forever like that's a very common motive described by depressed people so like uh, Ali Brosh who I quote in the in my book like she has that excellent you know the, the do all the things meme like mm. that meme is from a comic where she describes how like first she wants to do all the things and then Later on, she gets dejected at the prospect of, oh, I have to do all the things again uh -huh. and uh -huh. again. And it just feels overwhelming. Yeah. Whereas if you read like, you know, like some very happy, like kind of Buddhist adjacent uh, perspectives, they're like, oh, you know, just enjoy washing the dishes and don't think about like beyond that. Like just wash the dishes as you're washing the dishes, you know, enjoy the soap, enjoy the, like, like don't, you know, it's, it's thinking beyond things and having that, that sort of, like like grand scale and the thing is sometimes grand scales can be inspiring and exciting and sometimes they can just feel overwhelming and like the trick with framing and so like one of my chapters is experiment with framing so the trick with framing is to change the frame until you enjoy it until you find a frame that you feel is compelling and, and see so some people say things like oh no do 100 things that's so many things and i'm like change the frame do, do five things you know just you know whatever it is that works for you but the, the cool thing about the 100 thing frame is that i would say it's it sounds doable, right? Anybody can count to a hundred. You can try it now and just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not going to go to hundred, but you can do it. 
and you find that, huh, it took a little bit longer than you think. You think, oh, I can count to 100, no problem. And then you start 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Oh, it's cute. It goes on for a while. Like, it's longer than you think, but it doesn't seem like that much. It seems manageable. Anybody feel, most people feel like, I could do a hundred or something. I've definitely done a hundred or something before. I've, I've like eaten McDonald's a hundred times for sure. Right. Like, and this, like, so it's, there's a sense of a hundred things is doable, but it's also kind of more ambitious or bigger in scale and scope than what you would casually do randomly. Right. So like record a hundred songs or write a hundred blog posts. When you're done with that, that's the scale of that project is large enough that you will definitely have learned something along the way, Like you would have changed somewhat along the process of doing that. And so in my case, like, because I'm, I, I, I went big from the start, I'm like, I want to do a thousand word moments because I don't write a million words. That feels mm-hmm. very dramatic. And so I've, I'm, I've crossed 800,000 at this, 800, 807 word moments at this point. So I've done a hundred word moments of a thousand words eight times, right? And each time I've done it, I can feel that I, I level up in some way. Like every hundred thousand words or so, or maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more, but like every, Every time I cross that threshold, I feel like I'm a better writer. I feel like I understand myself better, understand words better. And it's like, it's transformative. Like, so, and people want to be transformed. You know, it's like people want to experience, like, so it's, it's very, it's, uh, it's very accessible. Anybody can do it, right? You can, you can pick up a pen and doodle a hundred things right now. And you'll be done in a couple of hours. Maybe if you, if you make it something small and simple, or if you want to do something slightly more complex, it might take a couple of weeks. It's manageable it's you can set your own deadline your own timeline your own scope and when you're done you feel a sense of accomplishment and you learn stuff along the way like you so some people say things like oh you know what if i do the same 10 things like and then i don't get better and just keep doing the same thing i'm like well you just brought it up yourself right so you notice so you do the first 10 things and it starts to look samey and then you ask yourself why why does it look samey what if i do it a bit differently how do i you know like so the the work if you're if you're conscious, if you're atten- if you're paying attention, so you do have to be paying, paying paying some amount of attention. But if you're paying attention, the work will almost guide you to where it wants to go. Like if you if you can kind of be have that slightly flexible attitude about it. So I mean, some people when they just hear the idea of two hundred things, they immediately get excited and they they can connect all the dots themselves. Some people it turns out they have a bunch of blockers along the way because of their assumptions about what the hundred things should be. Some people some people assume that. It should be do a hundred things really well. I'm like, no, do it, do a hundred hearts. So I have to start saying, do make a hundred misshapen pots, you know, like <laughs> do it badly on purpose so that, because even doing things badly on purpose will teach you something about making stuff. And Definitely. It, yeah, so it's, it's just getting people into the habit of, of volume because you will make good stuff by accident sometimes. And then you can reverse engineer. Oh, how come that, how come that looks good? Like I've, I've you know, like typically I assume it's going to be bad and I'm trying to make things bad on purpose. But like I accidentally made something good. Like what went into that? So it's like a sufficiently, you know, kind of nuanced understanding of your mistakes leads to mastery. Because now you can, if you can make it, if you can, if you can make things worse, you can also reverse it and make things better, right? So a fun thing to ask people sometimes is like, you know, like if they're having a bad day, you ask them, how, how could you make this worse, <laughs> right? And it's like, without that pressure of, I need to be better, I need to fix things, right? Like that, that pressure is very um, stifling. But if you kind of have, so, you know, you introduce some humor to it, you introduce some playfulness, you're like, how could I make things worse? Oh, you know, uh, I could pour some water over my head and I'd be like cold. And then you're like, oh, you know, so you, then you think about that. Well, what, what is the thing about pouring water over your head that makes everything worse? It's like, oh, you know, now I feel cold and uncomfortable. Oh, so you feel physically uncomfortable. What would make you feel the other way around? What would make you feel more physically comfortable? Oh, maybe you should get a, get a jacket. Or, you know, do you feel cold? How do you feel? And like, so each thing that you think about that would make things worse, it's negative um, companion or it's inverse will make things better. And then you just accumulate all of those things. So you make a long list of things that would make your life worse and then you just flip it and do the, other, the opposite thing and then like, ta-da, your life is better. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And you practice that and you get good at it. You know, it's like you can practice anything. And so it's, it, it all becomes this big fun game. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's ultimately mm-hmm. the, the, the real move. You talked there about like the re- using this challenge as the like framing device of like, oh, it's, it's slightly bigger than something you might do, but it's doable. And uh, mm-hmm. I forget how this came up, but last summer, um there was an exchange that we had where like you were talking about um this like do 100 thing challenge and um i I think it was you were mentioning that you wanted to like have people do 100 do 100 people do 100 things oh get 100 people to do 100 things yeah 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 and then uh someone i think rich bartlett made a joke of like oh get 100 people to do 100 do 100 thing challenges and you're like oh it'll be a while before i'm you know, like I find enough mm-hmm. insane people for that or something. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
And, and that, um, like you, you yourself were trying to do do a hundred mm-hmm. hundred things. So right. that got me thinking, and I was like, oh man, that that feels really big. But also it piqued my curiosity. Um, so I, I started a thread myself and I have like 14 200 things challenge. And I'm I'm just gonna like append to them as I go and like we'll see how yeah. far I get. But yeah. I, I'm I'm wondering like what what is the frame or like ambition behind that scale of like do a hundred a hundred thing challenges? Uh, I mean, so yeah, I I don't think you know it's like we need to f- be fixated about trying to make sure that oh i have to collect 100 100 uh-huh. things right like like it's more of like you i, I would rec- so i would definitely recommend try and finish one first before you do another mm-hmm. but then again you know if maybe it's your second or third thing is more exciting so really these projects are and the thing about 100 things is that you can't really force yourself to do it unless you're really mm-hmm. kind of uh, like masochistic and i don't recommend it like i would say if you think you want to do 100 of something, you try it. And if let's say by like 15 or 20, you just don't feel like it, like stop. Like, you mm-hmm. know, it, it's it, the, the, the thing is telling you that that's not really for you. You know, mm-hmm. like, so I, one of my things was like draw 100 hours. I drew yeah. like nine and the ninth one was really good. And I, it makes me confident that if I drew 91 more, it would get <laughs> really good. But like, I, I'm not that passionate about drawing hours. And like, like, I learned that about myself in the process of drawing nine hours. So I'm yeah. happy with nine. Like, you know, there's other things that I want to do more than that. And, yeah. But I may get around to eventually drawing it. Maybe I'll draw one a year, you know, like every year mm-hmm. I'll draw one or something like uh-huh. that. So it's, there's no rush to try and get it all done at once so so then the idea of attempting a hundred different hundred thing projects that's less about you know like trying to complete stuff and more about like let me learn more about myself in multiple domains so like mm. the more it's like breath right like how many different like what about music what about dance what about just like it's just giving myself permission to fool around and and, and explore and it could be that you find that there's one thing that you you start and like you get to 100 really fast and now you want to do a 200 and 300 and then that turns out to be your thing right it's like the thing that just comes very very naturally to you so you don't know so i, I wouldn't be too um i don't want to over over like you know you can you can you can make a plan too oppressive almost right and the plan should always be kind of sketchy like it should be exciting and interesting and if it starts to feel like it's not working out like then ditch it Let's try something else and yeah you know i a funny thing about having something like a directive like 200 things is you really and it starts to take off you really start to encounter every possible like negative or hostile interpretation Uh of it Uh and which is interesting you know like some people should really just ignore the whole thing completely because it's just not doesn't play well for them based on their experience which is fine Mm -hmm. you know like there's many different paths to off um but yeah you know I, i would say that the underlying thing is try and grok the principles of just quantity experimentation being willing to fail being willing to screw around and and being prolific like just those, <laughs> those are those are the kind of general things like the numbers don't really matter that much and you can you can kind of mess around with it and, and pick something that that you like like it doesn't need you don't need to feel like oh if i've done you know like 90 and i can't do 91 i, I fail like no that's not that's not that isn't what matters like you get to decide what matters mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah totally I think something really sparked for me there seeing that as a possibility of like, um, well, one, it wasn't, it wasn't like oppressive for me. It wasn't like, oh no, I have to nice. do a hundred, a hundred things. It was like, oh, this, this would be really cool. I could see I'm already getting better at the things I'm doing. Like I finished a hundred drawings earlier this year, getting like started from like crap and like getting pretty nice. good. And it's like, oh, there's, I could get good at a lot of things. And like, there's a lot of things I'd like to get good at. And it's a very... It's, yeah, it's such a tractable way to like learn something new or improve. It's like, I, I, I've always, like with the drawing ones, I've always like made the first ones that I made like kind of bad. It's like, okay, we're starting from like very low bar and like, that's really right. helpful. And it's like, I could just always take the next step to getting better at a lot of different things. And that, that was a very empowering frame for me. Yeah. yeah. I guess, yeah, it gives, it gives you a sense of continuity. So like, if you make a bad, a, a thing that looks, embarrassing and uh-huh. like sloppy or whatever it's no longer just i made this terrible thing but like 
this is a terrible thing that I made en route to making better things. So you no longer exactly. need to feel a sense of like like shame or guilt. I mean, you, you, you never did in the first place, but like it gives you a, a context to narrativize it in. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you have, when you've completed it or you've made a substantial progress, now you have a story you can show people. You can be like, this was my first thing that I did and this was like 73. And people are like, oh, my, oh wow, like, you've improved so much. How did you do it? And like that gives you an opportunity to connect with other people. Like, you know, it's just, it, it's just so good on so many levels. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a lot of like cross transference between the things too. Like, um, one of the, one cool unexpected thing was like, I when I started, I had already had like 85 blog posts or something, and my blog mm -hmm. posts are very long and big, and so it's like getting the last 15 is going to be, you know, challenging, but I'll I'll get there eventually. But like, I've been having Sylvia illustrate my mm -hmm. blog posts, nice. and she makes incredible illustrations. But then, yeah, like so now I'm I'm getting to the point where I can illustrate some of my own. Uh, blog posts and nice. it's like oh that's a real real milestone so wonderful yeah um yeah so i look forward to seeing that continue um yeah one question i want to ask you about this as well is like i'm i'm interested in the the riff about like listing your talking points and mm -hmm. like i'm curious what you would say the value of that is um that it sort of took me by surprise when I first saw that. And I was like, okay, especially the frame is like, I don't know, talking points like in like traditional media, it's like, oh, I'm I'm like a politician and there's like, we're, we're going to do this with the economy or something. So, so it's like an interesting frame to be like, oh, maybe you could just list the things that you repeatedly say and like figure out how to say them well so that it's persuasive or something. But like, yeah, what, what what's the value in doing that? And what, what would you say about that? Yeah, I guess the, the tricky thing about like, politician talking points in that sense it's there's very there's this sense of like they are gonna stick to their talking points and they're not gonna listen to you like so they're gonna like so if they are if they are in like a you know like a journalist asking them about something and then they like divert from the question to go back to their talking point like that's kind of um you know it's it's well you know it's i guess people associate it with a very hostile uh like conversation environment so like it's the if the journalist is trying to make you look bad then they're like oh stick to your talking points like don't don't let them uh -huh. use leading leading questions uh -huh. to get you you know mired in something else and then there's a headline it's like so yeah there's that and i'm not that's not really the domain that i, I mean I, I could operate in such a domain if i had to but i don't like those domains in the first place which is why i don't run for office and i don't you know like i, I just think there's there's a lot of interesting work that we could be doing outside the traditional models of of power and all of those things and but yeah you know i just i've always i guess it's, it's really a consequence of being so prolific so i just i've been writing so much for so long and i've been talking to so many people for so long that i can't help but notice patterns in my utterances and in just the things that i talk about and I have found, you know, one of the ways I talk about this is like pave your desire paths, right? So a desire path is if you have a field of grass, for example, the paths that people like to walk, like, so they might, there might be like one paved path across the center and people might be walking diagonally across the field because there's somewhere they want to go. Like maybe there's an ice cream stand or something. And so over time, the paths that people walk out of desire because they want to go somewhere, those paths become, you know, they get worn in and then you see the paths in the field. And so, you know, my thing is, so do what you love, first of all, like do what you enjoy, talk about what you love, what you're curious about, like start there. Like, so don't, don't feel obliged to come up with your talking points first. Like that's tricky. Like that's, I discourage that. Like, so like articulating your talking points, I would say it's like a mid game or late game move. Like you shouldn't be thinking about your talking points on day one. Like that's after you've written hundreds of thousands of words and you've been, or, you know, just maybe 10,000 tweets or something. Like you've just been talking to a lot of people and you notice that, Hey, like, in a dozen conversations that I had, like seven out of them, I brought up this topic and it seems to resonate with people. And, you know, it seems to lead to, like it livens up the conversation. And when you have that, then it's useful to know what it is. Then you can kind of like take it out of like the random box of random things that you have. And you can put it like kind of in on your like psychic, your psychological altar of, of precious talking points basically or ideas right like this riffs riffs that you you love the most right so maybe riffs is a more like ideologically neutral phrase right just your 100 favorite riffs like in in music or in melodies right your favorite melodies and yeah you know and, and you want to understand them as well as possible so it's not just about repeating the phrase itself although i do have a bunch of phrases that i repeat like word for word but even then it's like you know if you quote tweet a different thing each time and you append the same phrase you you, you are adding 
you know nuance to it and you're, you're showing how you how you choose to use it in different contexts but even then you know i would say that the majority of my talking points are things that i try to apply in different domains i try to and i, f- I feel like they converge from multiple contexts and yeah you know i just i found it to be very helpful for me i, I don't know if i would prescribe it or, or suggest to other people that oh everyone should know what the talking points are but you know if you have any interest if you have any interest in spreading so there's this great book by dan and chip Heath called made to stick and it's about it's kind of about marketing but it's, it's just about messaging right like so suppose you have a message that you think is important and and you need to get that message out there like some people do all this spending on advertising and like just trying to reach as many people as possible you know some people spam like ten thousand people with an idea because they think it's important but that, that's that's like one variable like the reach of your message but the second variable that's important is like the stickiness of your message like when a person hears it does it stick like do they remember it do they care and it's like what's the point of reaching a lot of people if if they're going to forget everything that you said because what you said didn't resonate with them or just wasn't sticky it wasn't memorable wasn't anything and some people would be like oh you know we shouldn't have to care about these things because you know it's like wow it's like we live in the like, you can be very cynical about it and be like oh we live in this 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 um kind of sound bite culture where everyone has horrible attention span and like people are so lazy they should be more hardworking and read everything more closely would be nice but like mm-hmm. you know i always believe in like meeting people where they are and if people are overwhelmed and tired and don't have the, the energy to kind of figure out why they care about a thing i can do that work for you especially if my message is important to me you know if i if if it's important to me that people hear my idea i take it upon myself articulate my idea in a way that when people encounter it it resonates with them and they care about it and it, it, they take it with them and then they they make it the ass even you know and then they spread it with their friends like so it's it's really just if you care enough about a message then you should care about how it comes across right mm-hmm. and, and you do that by practicing it you know reusing the riff in multiple contexts and seeing how people respond to it see how people understand it misunderstand it what they are you know, so like even in this conversation, I mentioned a few of the things that people say with regards to do a hundred things. I listed a few of those things in the book as well. And like, I anticipate that, you know, when I give a hundred talks about do a hundred things and have a hundred conversations <laughs> with people, I will then develop a, a list of all of the hundred top, the top hundred misunderstandings and, and like blocking points and things that trouble people about, about do a hundred things. And then I can kind of preemptively, you know, tell you what are the things that people struggle with and that's that's expertise right so sufficiently advanced knowledge of your mistakes so see i'm, I'm repeating the thing that i said earlier so that's that's a riff that's a talking point yeah a sufficiently advanced understanding of misunderstandings is understanding it's, and it's like it's like oh wow it's, everything is the same thing it's really just it's just pay attention do the thing get feedback from the thing whether it's from reality or from people like see what people say see what happens when you do the thing uh, study the outcome ask yourself how that deviated from your expectations modify your expectations accordingly try it again see what happens it's like kind of like the scientific method i guess i mean i don't want to make claims that this is science but it's kind of sciencey it feels fancy and yeah anybody can do you know it's 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 like diy figuring shit out and mm-hmm. you can go very very far with this i think people don't realize this like just messing around a little bit and paying attention to there's this great quote by someone from mythbusters so Adam Savage is quoted as saying it, although he was quoting somebody else, but like, uh, it's just the difference between doing science and fucking around is just writing <laughs> down the results, right? So yeah. write down, so fuck around a lot and write down a lot of the results. And then if you notice patterns, you're like, oh, every single time that I go to bed, um, you know, eating a late dinner, I wake up the next morning feeling like shit. Like you have to write it down to remember it. And then once mm. you see, oh, I have a pattern here. Like, oh, you can, what, what can I do to change the pattern? And then you change the pattern, you feel good. And then like, oh shit. And just do this in every domain of your life. And like in a few years, you feel amazing. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's less, that, it's less that like, oh, um, it seems like a bad frame and like I'm skeptical of it. And more that it like caught me by surprise and it made me curious about like, what the value is to someone that's outside of a traditional domain. And like, uh, I could see what the value for you is of listing your talking points, but I was like, Oh, what mm-hmm. would that be a valuable thing for me? Or who is it valuable for? And I like that you say that's like, uh, like a mid-level thing of like, Oh, if, you, if you're starting to be prolific and, and also it sounds like if there's a message that you really care about or something you want to share with the world, like it makes sense to reflect on how you communicate that message or, or those different things. 
Yeah, I would say, you know, so any domain that you operate in, so maybe you're like a software engineer, right? Or maybe you work in education. Just what, whatever, the do, if you work in some domain, there are going to be things about that domain that consistently frustrate you or that, you know, that people systematically misunderstand, whether it's like in fitness, whether it's in nutrition, whatever it is you can think about, like nothing, nothing is solved. You know, everything is, is in varying degrees of disrepair and chaos. And so it really helps to have, you could think of it as like, like having a list of FAQs, right? Like what are the questions, what are the questions that people mm. typically have? What do people typically mess up? And if you as a practitioner in some domain are able to very swiftly identify what people's mistakes are and then very swiftly apply a solution that is, then you look, I mean, so not only do you help people with their problems, you appear to be someone who, and it's correct. It's, a, it's an accurate appearance, right? If you, you demonstrate that you are able to solve problems quickly, and to some people, that's you know that looks like genius, but it's not. It's not you know like a, it's a quote from one of the pen and teller saying like magic is just putting in more effort than people think is reasonable, mm. right? You're just preparing and understanding a domain really well, and like you don't need to be a genius if you care about a domain enough that you're just studying it very very well and you just know it very very well. So like a very very good teacher is not only familiar with the subject matter; they know all of the mistakes that their students would make. And when their student makes a mistake, they're like, "I recognize this mistake because I've seen." Every year I see students make this mistake. And the first thing you need, and, and they might say, what do you think about this? And they ask exactly the right question that you need, that the student needs to hear that would then guide them to figuring out the solution themselves. So it's not like you tell them what the problem is, but you, I mean, you could, that might be the first thing that you do. And then you find that's a better way. Right? Just, there's, always, there's always a better way to do things and you can just always keep iterating and improving. And it's, it's fun. It's fun to, to witness yourself get better at your domain. Right and and be able to navigate more nimbly. It's it's like the pleasure of being fit in a sense, but it's in a idea space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier, like the book made to stick, and mm -hmm. how that's sort of ostensibly a marketing book, but it's really about anything to do with messaging. Yeah. And I want to ask you about that because you know when you worked for Dinesh, like you were doing content marketing, mm -hmm. and like we're yeah. working in marketing and. I feel like watching what you're doing, how to put this, like you're not spending your time trying to be like the world's best marketer for the biggest company so you can make the mm. most money. Like you seem pretty yeah. disinterested in that. Uh, yeah. But you have the skills in marketing and like know mm. how to do things. And then you're using those skills like for your mm. own project, which I, I think is a great project. Like, And I'm curious how, yeah, like how the, the work that you did in marketing and the skills that you built there are like shaping the endeavor that you're trying to do now. Right. So, you know, I would say from the very, so there's this great lecture by Randy Posh uh, called The Last Lecture. So he was like dying of cancer when he gave it. And it's just this beautiful lecture about achieving your childhood dreams and how to live your life, basically. And he told an anecdote of how um, one of his mentors said, uh, Randy, you're an excellent salesman. And what that means is that anywhere you go in the world, people are going to try and recruit you to sell stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to sell stuff, you might as well sell something worthwhile like education. So that's what he did. He was like as a professor and he was working in with like uh, just trying to advocate for better education. Just you know, I watched that when I was like 17 or 18, I think. And it, it just seemed obviously a good life to me. Mm -hmm. you know, he, and here's a guy who's like at the, at the end of his life, like sadly premature, but like, everyone who knew him loved him and respect him and respected him and admired him I'm like you know, that's how i want to live uh, other than that i would say you know so even as a teenager or whatever just figuring out my life i'm like what do i want to do you know <laughs> and uh, this is this like what are my options right and i think at some point i i thought about it in terms of like uh so peter drucker i think has an idea of like there's basically three things that you do in, in business or just in creating value or just participating in the marketplace. You make something, you sell something, or you, you handle the money, like or the books, right? So in, in any operation, like any business that you're running, like, and it might all be the same person, right? If you're just a one-man lemon, lemonade stand, you make the lemonade, you sell the lemonade, and then you have to do your accounting and manage your money and, and keep the lights on or whatever. And when you scale that to a large organization, you have um, innovation or product and then you have marketing or sales and then you have like everything HR legal like all the things that keep the lights on for the for the first two things to do to to keep doing what they do and from Drucker's perspective uh, he says innovation and marketing are the only 
two real functions of business. Everything else is just kind of making sure that those two things can keep doing what they do. And innovation is like creating the product and marketing is creating a customer where a customer is a, we can get very technical about this. The idea is the customer is a, a pattern of human behavior in, so it's not really a person. So when people say the customer is always right, they don't mean this specific person is always right. They mean that the pattern of human behavior that the kind of idealized abstract customer is always right. Anyway, uh, so when I evaluated that, um, I thought about making stuff, you know, and I was thinking, I guess at the time I was thinking about it as like, so you could make stuff like, you know, you could be a chef or you could be a, you could be an engineer. But that's before I thought about software. So it's just like any kind of building, right? And I have met people who are good at those things. And, you know, I have an appreciation for it, like craftsmanship. I appreciate it. But I don't think I will ever be world class at it because like I've seen the kind of obsessive attention to detail and stuff that people have. And I don't really have that. I'm kind of a little bit sloppy and a little bit kind of loosey goosey. And then on the other side, like if you talk about like balancing the books, like accounting and like legal and I can't stand that shit. Like I hate, <laughs> I hate having to touch money. You know, I'll do it if I have to, but like I would prefer to not do. Like if I can trust someone else to do it and like, I'll just let them do everything. Right. And, uh, and whereas marketing or sales, like to me, that's fascinating. It's like, it's like philosophy to me, you know, it's like you can make a thing more valuable by rearranging things around it. So, and that's, it seems subjective, but you can, you can literally raise the value of something by telling a story about it. Right? You tell a story about something, you raise its value, you can raise its value. And there's, there's all these things about meanings and talismans and, and just this whole domain of of understanding stories and meaning and value and perception. Like all of this is just, it's my jam. It's like the stuff I love, you know? And so it was pretty clear to me that of those three major like skill trees, I was going to like dive into uh, selling stuff and making like marketing stuff and just telling stories, figuring shit out. And, you know, so even in the early days when I used to play in a band, like I was very much in, like I, I should have, spent more time practicing my instrument and like writing songs with my friends and all those things. And we did do some of that, but the thing that really kind of excited me was, Oh, you know, how are we going to, what's our band name? You know, what's our, what's our vibe? What's our, our pitch? You know, how do we present ourselves when we're going to go on stage? You know, what, what's our, what are we going to talk about? What's, what's the event that we're going to set up for people? And it, you know, even then it wasn't like, some people think of marketing as, oh, you come up with some bullshit story and you put some like fake packaging and you make some like like bullshit promises and that's marketing. Like that's like the worst of marketing. You know, that's like the 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 manipulative, abusive class of marketing. But like this is like if you strip that away, right? And you refuse to to parley with the you know kind of bullshit artists, like then there's still the real the real question of how are people to think conceive of this event? How are they to exp- like so as a as a band, for example. How do I make sure that people have a good time? Like that's what I want. I want people to have a good time, and people having a good like so. Part of it is you got to play good music, and that's the like like making like the creative kind of uh innovation, like the the building stuff part, right? Like you have to practice your instruments and be good at your job. So like at the technical side of things, so that people don't have a bad time with bad music. But you know, it, it only apply. It only matters up to a certain threshold. Like the average non musician can't really tell if like you're not perfectly on the beat or you're not perfectly in tune or whatever like they mostly go by vibes and then so you know how are the vibes are the vibes good like how do you determine how the vibes feel and part of it is does your you know lead singer or whoever's talking to the crowd are they doing good crowd work are they making the crowd feel good like and that's a a variable that can completely change how people feel that that night went like did they have a good time with their friends or was it kind of eh you know and like that's a, a thing i would like to influence and the idea that i could influence it without practicing my instrument to me it just felt like cheating but it's a very real thing it's a thing that has very real consequences for people and you can improve people's lives just by thinking about this stuff and so that's where i want to operate also i know that um you know historically a lot of innovations they just languish because people made great people made like breakthroughs in products and then just they didn't know how to talk about it and no one heard about it you know so on, in my 50 year work in progress document that i have i talk about the losef problem losef there's this guy who's russian who um he basically invented leds like almost a couple of decades before anybody else maybe even earlier than that but like he he if he had been able to connect with like the scientific establishment or like engineers and stuff 
the world may have been like LEDs may have come around like decades earlier. But he was like, you know, he was like this reclusive nerd who didn't have any friends and he was like publishing by himself. He wrote a letter to Einstein, but like Einstein probably had too much correspondence and didn't even get the letter. And it's just really sad. It's a really sad story. He's a genius who nobody knew about until like he died. And like he could have made the, he, the world could have advanced faster if he had a friend who was plugged in, right? And who could teach him how to pitch himself and how to, you know, tell his story or how to talk to people in a way that, would demonstrate his value. But he didn't know how to do that. He just knew how to do... He just he knew how to do amazing things with LEDs, but like mm-hmm. nobody else could see the value of what he did. So teaching people to see value is a gift. You can... It's a really... You know, teaching... It starts with teaching people how to appreciate stuff, appreciating yourself, appreciating your life, your... your you know, your, your the books in your life, your movie. Like you can improve your life just by thinking. Like that's just... This is bonkers to me, right? It's just such a... Such a like you can just go for a coffee somewhere and just decide. I want to think about my life. What do I like? You know what's nice? What's beautiful? What do I enjoy? And you just think about those things, and your life becomes better from that process. And then, then I want to scale that. I want to help other people also enjoy that. And yeah, it's a skill set that you can use to sell products for capitalism if you want. But you know, there's more worthwhile things to sell. I'm trying to sell the idea of of you know let's rebuild the library, the Baghdad House of Wisdom. <laughs> Let's let's get you know a million friendly ambitious nerds you know in every, like some a few hundred in every major city like let's let's make the world awesome you know like we we could do that and we could we can create a vision for people to get excited about to live into to orient themselves around like we can do it it's like it's 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 just it's continuously bananas to me so uh, I mean your your specific question was kind of like about what do I did what did I do at work that inform my stuff I would say well, the good thing well, about how does it shape how do those skills shape what you're doing with your endeavor now. Yeah. I would say, uh, you know, like, so working in an office and working for like a software company, having like a bottom line, having, you know, products to sell, like bills to pay, like, you know, like, so we had to pay our salaries and stuff like that. Uh, that did give me practice with a kind of um, uh, outcome oriented thinking. And, you know, once you've had spent some time in that space, it becomes very clear when you meet people who are not, very outcome oriented so they're kind of vaguely just gesturing about like oh i would like to start a business and i would like to and you're like no but what do you want to do what kind of outcomes do you want to achieve right how many how many how much product do you want to sell how much you know what how many people do you want to meet how many like this this is a more quantified approach and some people you know they they hate numbers and they hate like they just feel that it chokes the life out of everything and that's if you go too far, you know, that's if you like choke the golden goods. But again, it's like, just as with plans and being like drawn in pencil, I feel like similarly, like having projections, again, like, I guess if you are like a Fortune 500 company or something, then your projections become very, very important. Your accounting and all that becomes very consequential. But, you know, I would say even for like volunteers coming together to do something for fun, having some sense of outcome orientedness can you know lead you to making breakthroughs and and i would i would draw an analogy to like let's say you want to work out right like and if you're just working out and you enjoy working out you don't want to think about it you just like to go to the gym and just lift some weights and whatever and you're fine like that's you can if you're having a good time that's fine but what i do know is that you know you have some personal best right how much what's the most amount of weight you can squat what's the most amount of weight you can bench like that sort of thing you have some personal best. You can find out what it is. And you may not, you might be going to the gym regularly and not know what it is because you've never tested yourself. So first, first of all, test yourself. Right? That's you find out what your limits, your limits are. Then, you know, if you are so inclined, consider trying to go past that limit by progressively training yourself up to that point. And then once you've done that, the moment you... So for me, like I remember the, when I was young, I used to think, I'm so tall, I'm so skinny, I'm I, I embarrassed to do squats with weights and I'm just always going to have skinny legs and be embarrassed by it and blah, blah, blah. And eventually I got sick of that. I'm like, no, I don't want, I don't want that to be my story. You know, I don't want to be like, as though like there's this, this icky domain that I'm afraid of. Like, fuck that. I want to, you know, I want to do, I want to feel like I can walk into that space and own it. And, I, and so I did that. I got myself a squat rack in my own house and I trained my, I taught myself how to squat. And the day that I squat, squatted 90 kg, which was like more than my body weight. So my body weight was like 85 kg at the time. The day that I squatted 90 kg, I felt euphoric. I felt like, wow, I can shatter a limiting belief. Like that's, that, that's a thing that I thought I could not do. And at the time I could not do it, but I could work myself up to doing it and I've done it. And like, 
what else, you know, what's next? What's, what else do I think is limiting me that isn't actually, that's imaginary boundaries, right? What are things that, and so, you know, which some people having done that, they would then think, oh, that's a very nice high. I'm going to chase 100 kg and then 110. And then you become a professional weightlifter and you lift more and more. That's fine. You know, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you enjoy, that's great. But for me, I, I, I just needed to know that I could cross that threshold with, you know, planning and sense of will. And I didn't, I then bring that with me to everything else. And yeah, so just being able to think in outcomes is means being able to make outcomes happen. And being able to make outcomes happen is power. And like power is excellent when you're using it to achieve goals that you deem, you know, worthy, worthwhile, effective. I mean, so there is, you know, some, some people pursue power without temperance and equanimity and like, you know, they, they do it in a needy way. Like maybe they, they have some unresolved issues within themselves and then, you know, feeling powerful in some domain makes them feel like they are worthy or something. And then, so it can go too far in those, in those senses. But like I, you know, I have this tweet that's like prickles for my gooey friends and goo for my prickly friends. So when I meet my friends who are like, you know, some of my friends are like, oh, I'm going to get a raise. I'm going to crush my sales deadlines. I'm like, yeah, but have you considered, you know, just kind of bumming for a weekend and just not doing anything? Like it's just, you know, just to consider the, the value of the perspective that you don't inhabit. And like on the flip side, like prickles for my gooey friends, it's like, you know, you guys have such great perspectives and, and you're having such a good time amongst yourselves. And that would be great if you if that's all you want. But like, have you considered that you could help more people if you want? And like, how are you going to reach those people? Who, where are you going to go and talk to them? In a way, what kind of stuff are you going to produce that's going to reach them? Like there's, there's all these outcome-based things you can think. And I'm not going to insist that people, everyone should become more outcome-focused. Like again, it really depends on, on what what people are dealing with right and sometimes people are just happy and if this happy it's fine you know, there's no no pressure and i would be like you know i i have outcomes that i would like to see and i invite people to to join me if they would like and if they don't like it that's fine you know it's just it's to each their own you know no pressure no coercion do whatever you like but you know there's a lot of opportunity to in the world to make things better and i like you know that things are getting better when you can see better outcomes, right? As opposed to, oh, I feel good doing something that seems good. Like that's, uh, I, I think that's kind of, uh, respectfully, I feel like that's a kind of amateurish, which is, again, it's fine to be an amateur. An amateur is like a hobbyist person who enjoys what they do. But like, if you know that in your heart and in your mind from like just doing the reading and, and all the stuff that you, you're capable of, you know, you're helping a thousand people now and you could help a million people if you put your mind to it. Like, why not? And if you can do it without being, without developing like a complex about it and without becoming like a martyr or becoming power, like there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that can go wrong. So you have to be, you, I do advise that you be careful not to like get swept up in it. Like, so even with like pursuing celebrity, for example, right? like wanting more Twitter followers, like at, the more followers you get, it becomes it becomes something that kind of consumes you a little bit. It becomes more and more of like a psychological extreme sport. So like 3,000 followers is different from 300 followers. 30,000 is different from 3,000. 300,000 is surely different from 30,000. Like it just, it's going to get more and more difficult in certain ways. People are going to expect more from you. People are going to project their shit at you. There's all kinds of things that are going to happen. But like, again, like so if you're thinking, I want more followers, then you might end up optimizing along like, you're doing whatever is the easiest thing that gets the most followers, which is typically pandering to the lowest common denominator, which I highly advise against. But rather, the point is, think about who you want to reach and what message you want them to receive and how do you get it out to the next person who is not in the room who would be receptive to that, right? And then in the process of doing that, you'll, you, you may have to solve something along the way to do that. You may realize that, oh, I got to go and find people. Like, I, I seem to have tapped out this part of Twitter. Maybe I should get on TikTok. Maybe I should get on YouTube. There's all these other things to, to figure out and solve. And then you have to go out of your comfort zone and try difficult and different challenging things. But it's fun, right? Because everything's a game. Everything's do 100 things. Everything's embracing mistakes. So you learn some new thing, develop some new skills, find some new people, and then you can cross, you can introduce people across these domains to each other. And it's beautiful when you do that. It's like, there's this whole new world that emerges that didn't exist before. And it's like, you're like the proud daddy sort of, right? Like, like you, you help to make it happen. And yeah, you can encourage people, you know, you see their eyes light up as they feel a sense of possibility. And the more people there are, the more there's a kind of economy that emerges. So it's just better and better and better. And yeah, I would, I would attribute some of my ability to think this way to, you know, like working with Dinesh and having like outcome-centric thoughts. Like, you know, what, what, what are we trying to do here? You know, what's the outcome we want? 
how do we know when we've succeeded? You know, what is the proof? Like, when do we know we should celebrate? Like, so sometimes things like shipping a book. So that's great. Like, so the book's shipped. Then like, how many copies do you want to sell? So like, and you don't need to be like, I want to sell a million copies. Like that's, that might be unwise. You might, you might make bad decisions along the way. But like, if it's like, okay, I want to sell a thousand copies and then see what happens. So what happens? You have to, you have to be kind of curious and attentive and be really flexible. Like, okay, I sold a thousand copies and a bunch of people have said these things. And what's the most interesting things that people have said? You know, what's, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's cool? You know, like you, you do want to be sensitive to that. And I think people who get overly obsessed with some outcome, right? I want to be a billionaire, like some, some grand outcome that they're very fixated in and fixated on and have tunnel vision about. Like that's tricky because then they might make unethical decisions along the way. But, you know, if, if you always choose outcomes that are kind of slightly outside your comfort zone and then you go there and along the way, you're like, what did I learn from that? What interesting things happen? You know? And then just life just keeps getting more and more rich and nuanced and exciting and fun. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Remembering there was a really nice exchange that happened recently with you and Michael Ashcroft, where you kind of like gave him some feedback on his mm -hmm. uh, website <laughs> and kind of yeah. kind of some pro, pro bono marketing cult, consulting there. And uh, I'm wondering, like, what mm, what were you doing there, both like tactically suggesting to him, but also like why why did you help him? Uh, what, what I mean, I was procrastinating. That? I mean, in that moment, I was procrastinating <laughs> on my books, but uh -huh. and I felt like, you know, today was a kind of shit day because I didn't get much done on my book. So before I go to bed, it would be nice if I can do something nice in the world, mm. right? And so I, I like Michael. I think he's doing good work. I know that he's helping other people. So that's, that's the beautiful thing about the people that I associate with. Like, mm -hmm so many people around me are people who are trying to help other people so that if i help these people then i help even more people down the run, down the line right there's this guy sam who's doing this move <laughs> better project thing and like he's been fixing people's like back pain and neck pain shoulder pain like i just introduced him to people and it's wild but yeah so with michael i think my thing was just i mean i just have have an instinct for like you know what makes messages sticky and what what is well presented information and you know what's kind of noisy so i just look at the stuff and i'm like oh you know like first of all it's like what's what's the number one thing you want people to know right what's the most important thing that people have to hear you know so, so there's, there's a bunch of constraint based thinking i guess i learned that as well from like operating in in marketing for like especially when you're marketing something like like uh like a commercial product, right? So, because commercial pro people are very unforgiving with commercial products because they like don't have time. They don't care. Like, well, what is this? Some corporation trying to sell me shit? Fuck it. I'm not interested. So they're very harsh with that. And so it it challenges you to be like, uh, you know, you 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 can't be too sentimental about it when you're doing it. You really have to trial trial and error and figure out, you know, what resonates with people and stuff. And so yeah, I've developed a skill set where I understand, you know, just what. I can look at a message and I can figure out how to make it stickier. Pretty like it almost shows shows itself to me. It's like it's like almost like you you look at it. This is you know, I don't I don't want to be too dramatic. Uh, the, the dramatic quote would be the quote like Michelangelo. But I don't want to, I don't want to imply that I'm Michelangelo like. But like there's there's similar things like you know you see some you, maybe you see someone and they are not dressed very well, but you can imagine. If, if, you're if you're good at fashion and stuff, you can imagine like, oh, you know, you should just, you should wear stripes. You should wear this. And then you change, like Queer Eye does that, right? Like, so the, yeah, the guys from Queer Eye are lovely to witness. Like, they're mm. so like nourishing and supportive and they encourage people to experiment with their presentation. And they don't try to make you something you're not. They try to find something about you that is not being expressed very well. And they try to like bring that out in you. And like, like, like so become more of yourself in a, in a flourishing sort of way. And like, yeah, I can do that for people's writing. I can do that for people's personal websites, their Twitter profiles, like anything that's messaging, anything that's, so like all the stuff that I talked about earlier about marketing and, and you know, like pre presenting values. Like, again, sometimes a person has a page and it has like maybe 800 words on it. And there's like 20 words in there somewhere like, three quarters down and those 20 words are like oh mwah, it's beautiful it's like mm. this is the essence of what you do these 20 words but it's all the way down like three paragraphs down that no one might see it and so i'll be just like take those 20 words and like put them like at the top of the page bold header make it big and like it changes everything it just changes like by emphasizing what needs to be emphasized uh, it just people receive the whole thing differently and like it for me it's like it's so obvious and it's so little effort but I guess it, it comes from like years of, of like tinkering with tons of words and like experimenting with stuff and whatever. So I guess at this point, I, sh I should pitch myself. Like if anybody is looking for marketing consulting, like look up my, <laughs> this is the thing that I do. I want to help people. 
And I, I do need some money. So uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, let me know. Uh, DM me on Twitter if you want. <laughs> yeah, and I've, uh, I've worked with you before and it's been really helpful. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of years I have, ago. I've, that, was, that was some time ago. Yeah, I've, I've gotten more, I would say I've gotten more confident since. Mm. And like, you know, so it, you, it, I almost forgot that we, that we did stuff together. Yeah, like I, I guess I, you were one of my earlier solo clients. And yeah, I you were still charging 100 an hour at the time. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah got to get in early. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I charge 500 an hour now. And, and the, the reason I do that is, you know, it's not that I want to squeeze as much money as I can from people, but it's really, I want to get into the headspace of, in a consulting session, I want to create at least five hundred dollars worth of value for my. So I want to create at least like a thousand dollars of value. So I feel like I give you five hundred. I ask you, you know, you get at least a thousand, and you give me half of that. And you know, the thing about marketing is, if you do your positioning really, really well, it should permanently increase your sales for the rest of your life, or for, for the rest of your product's life, right? And yeah, so I want to get into the headspace where. I want clients who are interested in kind of that scale of work. So some people might not be able to afford that much right off the bat. And I would say, you know, let's chat anyway. And like, you know, if, if you feel, so one thing I said, if a guy who's like, he's working on like a music product for someone and for I me, mean, he's working on a music product for like, like a VR piano kind of thing. It's kind of cool, but like, he doesn't yet have a lot of cash. So I'm like, okay, like what you're doing sounds cool. I would like to help you with that. And like, you know, if you can only pay me, you know, 200 or whatever you feel is right, right? Like, let's just first agree that we can create at least $500 of value for your for your product. And if we can do that, then you pay me what you can now and you pay me the rest whenever. Like, I don't really care about give me the money now. You know, it's more of like, I want to make sure that our time is spent being that productive at least, right? And mm-hmm. I feel like that gives me something to aspire to. It makes, it challenges me to kind of, like make sure that I give people their money's worth and uh, as opposed to like, oh, let's just hang out and chat about marketing. Like I, I can do that for free and it doesn't feel that great. You know, I want to make sure that people, like kind of challenge people to, to, write, to raise their standards and aspirations. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a fun thing that we can do for each other. Definitely, definitely. I think related to this, um, well, yeah, first off, I'll just mention for anyone that like is interested in that but can't, maybe afford that or their projects really early. Like you have a marketing blog and like lots of stuff they've written or even, even for me, like just watching that exchange with Michael was super instructive. And like, I edited by page after that, like sort of applying the same advice. So, um, Oh man, I should totally do a blog post about that. Those tweets. Definitely. I'll do that. Yeah. That's a, a, yeah, it's very simple. It's very simple, right? It's kind of, but I, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how, I, and I, I guess like from the point of view of like, so for Sam, who's good with like helping people with their back mm-hmm. and stuff, he's probably like, just just move your legs a little bit and you feel <laughs> great. Like what, why, you know, like to each expert, like that their, the adjustments required seem so trivial and easy, but it's because they know this, they know their stuff so well. Right, totally, totally. But there's another facet of that though, that's like, yeah, with helping Michael or helping Sam or um, I don't know, another thing that you do is like, once a month or a couple of times a quarter, you'll like be like, Oh, here's some accounts that I like that are pretty small. Mm-hmm. Like maybe, yeah. maybe you'd like to follow them, uh, yeah. check them out. Uh, there's a lot of things that I see you doing like that, that are sort of, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess taking care of the like scene on Twitter or like connecting right. dots between people in ways that mm-hmm. are helpful. And I'm yeah. curious how you think about and approach that. Like what, what is that activity for you? What are you doing there? Why do you do it? Yeah. I mean, there's a, bu- there's a bunch of things. So one is I'll always remember what it was like to be a small guy, right? Mm. And feeling like I deserved an audience and like I was underappreciated and so on. And so I just want to give, in, in, so, you know, I guess the phrase give back is a bit loaded. People think of it as like charity or something. I don't see it as charity at all. I see it as investing in the scene, right? Mm-hmm. I think any scene for it to flourish, it needs continuous, fresh injections of fresh voices, new people, new perspectives. Mm-hmm. And like, if it's like the same 50 people talking about the same things for three years we'll get bored of each other and we'll start fighting for no reason because we're bored you know and mm-hmm. that's that's a thing that happens mm. whereas if you continually have new interesting people coming online and they have new perspectives and so on like then things stay fresh things stay interesting you know you, you don't you don't get tired of each other and yeah that's that's a big part of it uh i remember what it was like to be small and i want and i like to be able to give people that gift and yeah, like smaller people appreciate it so much more, you know? I mean, I don't mean that, that bigger people don't appreciate it, but it's like, I remember being small and it's like the affirmation and the support that you get when no one is listening to you yet is 
it just it just really means a lot right so mm-hmm. it, it it really you know like some people they have great tweets and they are at about 100 followers and they feel like no one's listening to them because like even their followers are maybe their friends who are not very online and they have great tweets and if you can just get them like 10 followers who will respond to their stuff you may set them on a path that they keep writing for like years and years and then eventually one day they write books or they just mm. they do wonderful things subsequently they just need support and so and I feel that like a lot of celebrities or famous accounts or whatever, they don't really care. I mean, I, I don't want to say they don't care, but like it's not as much of a priority for They're them. They're just anymore. broadcasting they, their thing. And, yeah, yeah, you know, it's very, and like this one of my talking points is that, you know, we have had social media for like a decade plus now, maybe close to two decades, the internet, maybe close to three decades. But like, you know, our, our thinking about, having an audience is still very much informed by old media norms like we think about it in terms of broadcasting like once you cross a certain threshold of followers just think of it as oh you know i have i have an audience of this size and i tell them stuff and i sell them stuff Mm -hmm. whereas like for me the most interesting thing about having an audience is that it's a network it's a graph you can talk to people you can ask questions you can solicit feedback you can introduce people to each other Mm -hmm. you couldn't do that over television right and so there are the understanding the society, like humanity's understanding of what can be done with social media, it's still very primitive. Like we don't have, even though we have YouTube celebrities and podcast celebrities, people with huge audiences, we don't really have the equivalent of people who are just very, very good community managers at who, who kind of are powerful and growing and continually weaving in everyone into their, their approach. Maybe, maybe they have been some people doing that and I haven't noticed. But like, um, I just feel like I have a vision for how I would do it and I'm doing it, you know, and I, and I feel like it's, it's what I would have wanted to participate in. And it's a very informal thing, you know, so I, I do have some friends who start more formal things like they have, you know, whether it's they're hosting an event or they uh, have a website with like, you know, like something that you can, you can buy a membership into. And I, I do think these things are good to have you know we should have we should have a variety of these things but i've always and especially because other people are already doing those things i think i am committing in the long run to be like the public square guy and it is this beautiful i felt so flattered when uh i think rich decibels again he he tweeted something about like uh you know in group it's a bunch of it's like archipelago of many different groups of people and then he said that uh, on a clear day, you can see me like the Colossus of Rhodes, like a, and you know I was very honored, but I was flattered on it, uh, slightly shy, but like uh, it's kind of what I've always wanted. You know, I've always wanted to be, and again, when you say the phrase public figure, it sounds like oh, you want to be a celebrity, you want to be a star. Like that's not what I mean. I want to be. So there's this great little video I have of uh, it's from the TV show Somebody Feed Phil. So Phil is Phil is one of the writers for um everybody loves Raymond so he's kind of like retired ish and he he you know he's fairly famous but like not like celebrity famous like he's like behind the cameras famous like so he he knows a lot of people but like he's not like like people don't mob him in the streets but uh anyway he he did an episode he he, so it's like a somebody feel feels like a it's like a food show but it's really I would say it's like a food show it's a culture show disguised as a food show or maybe you might say that about all food shows you know he's travel he travels around the world to go eat and like people show him around their neighborhoods and stuff. And, you know, in the Israel episode, he goes to, there's this, there's this place called Akko, I think. And there's this man named Uri Jeremiah, and they call him Uri Buri. And Uri Buri is like the unofficial town mayor. You know, he doesn't have, he's, he doesn't run for political office. He's just, he's like an old guy who's like a town historian. He's like, he has an ice cream parlor. <laughs> you know, he, he, he just does like a bunch of random shit. And he is like, um, uh, Phil describes him as like Bruce Springsteen like he walks down the street everyone knows him you know he's like the, the embodiment of the city and the keeper of the flame you know like it's just he's, he is the city right? and he's, he's, not, he's, not a, he's not an official people point at him and say ah that's the mayor of Akko and he's, he, he has no office he's just he's the first among citizens in a sense right he's just that and that's what I want for myself for my life you know I want to be someone who serves the community right like a like a li- like a libra- community librarian of people sort of you know like a switchboard connecting people like i, I don't want to make a lot of money i don't want to be like rich and famous i just want to you know to the degree that i want like some i want to have 
have money it's really to invest in other artists and other like i want you know i, I want to renovate my house so that it's comfortable for myself and my wife but that's about it i don't really have i don't want like a you know prestigious i don't want a car i don't want any of that i just i just want to live moderately comfortably and then beyond that i want to reinvest all my time and money into supporting other artists into other you know people who make stuff people who do stuff just interesting projects interest just make the life make, make the world cool right like, that's kind of what i want and this ties back into the scene thing. Like I have to like, so some people will be like, Oh, I have a lot of followers now and like get a lot of me every, every month, get a lot of me. <laughs> and like, you know, and I do like to talk about myself because I, I am the subject matter that I know best. So I, I share, sometimes people ask me like once in a while, I, I seem to piss some people off who think that I'm like narcissistic for talking about myself. And I'm like, I would love to talk about you instead. You know, do you mind? Like, can we talk about you? Because I, I volunteer information about myself because it would seem rude to, you know, like speculate about somebody else's life, you know, you know, so I want to, I speak about what I know and usually they tend to run away when I, when I ask them if they want to speak about themselves, but, um, you know, but an, a way to do the, can we speak about you is to look for people who are speaking about themselves and like signal boost them and introduce them to each other and just, just kind of ferment and, and, and nourish and support fresh voices. And then we'll have, I just want shit to be awesome. You know, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll be great to see people in a high trust, environment taking care of each other asking each other questions enjoying each other's company you know traveling the world to hang out it's awesome mm -hmm, mm -hmm. somewhere you um some i think someone shared with you and they were like yeah this is great uh something from McLuhan, where it was like mm -hmm. probably i'll just quote it here it's like problem mm -hmm. how to There's achieve amelia yeah. i haven't met anybody who even imagines the need for such a group um mm -hmm. and it seems like you're thinking on that scale and you felt like this like fraternity with him like yeah this we need this mm, and uh, i do yeah yeah and what 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 is that need and like why is it value valuable to the larger society to like have a scene or like have people collaborating and working together in this way yeah you know i was just i was in fact talking to dinesh about this recently when we mm. met and uh you know he said something like you know, there are a bunch of private individuals who are public goods, effectively. Like just by existing and doing their own thing, they provide a service to the rest of the world. They demonstrate what is possible, right? Like, uh, and and you know, so public goods should be publicly funded, right? Like then they're, they're in a they are insufficiently funded and appreciated and and valued. And you know, I would say that everything beautiful and wonderful and great in the world comes from if you investigate any such thing, you will almost always find that there was a scene at the heart of it. Like if you like Lord of the Rings, oh, it turns out that Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were part of a scene together, right? If you investigate, it's just pick a thing and investigate it and like find out why was the creator so ambitious? You know, why, why did Apple computer, you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were part of Homebrew Computing Club and they were trying to impress each other. And like jazz was invented by a scene, you know, it's like uh, Bob Marley and friends. There was like, and if you dig into the history of Bob Marley, it's like, reggae made it to like international prominence with like there's this thing called island records which was started by like some guy whose parents lent him like five thousand dollars like that was the difference between the world knowing about bob marley and not like five thousand mm. dollars five thousand mm. five like there are individuals who could have funded that and there are you know so my question is who are the island rec i don't even know the island record guy's name i can't remember it off the top of my head like he's i think it's like robert I don't know. It's like, but he, he is kind of like a shy, reclusive individual. So he's not like glory seeking. He just found that reggae was wonderful music and he wanted to, in Jamaica, and he wanted to share it with the world. And he did. And for $5,000 ish, the world received, I was, you know, millions of dollars worth of, and I don't want to think in terms of money because, you know, money is money, but like just the enjoyment, you know, like people have enjoyed reggae, you know, it soothes their spirits when they're stressed. Just like, how do you put a dollar on that? You know, it's just beauty and, and, art shared with the world for five thousand dollars and it's like what else so i'm wondering what else just needs five thousand dollars to take off right mm -hmm. and and chances are a lot of like the existing grant structures and stuff are going to miss it because it's, it's very weird strange arbitrary shit it's like you know like it might be some person who's like you know, so i have this friend um nicholas perry i think his his, his twitter handle is ultimate and he's doing like strange DIY science experiments 
And he, like, one of the things he was going to do, he was going to, like, eat dog poop to test some kind of, like, he has this very elaborate scientific theory for why, like, he, he does all the reading of all the biology papers and stuff, and he has some theory about, like, like intestine health, gut health stuff, and, and he wanted to eat dog poop, like, to study a thing, and, like, he needed a fridge. And I'm like, I will get you your fridge, <laughs> my man, like, you know, for, like, he needed, it's, like, 250 bucks or something, and, like, I raised it on Twitter. And it's just, you know, who's going to fund some random like anonymous account but he, he's funded and he's been like reporting his findings i don't know where that's going but you know he's just like a mad scientist you know, you know? And, like we, we need more mad scientists to get their money and they're not going to get it from like you know like important institutions so like yeah more funding for crackpots right mm. and like lovable nerdy crackpots and uh yeah so that's a public good and it is it's insufficiently funded and the way to get funding for it is to you know it's partially kind of through this spectacle sort of but even then with spectacle it's like then the most like so like uh, you know like the mr beast youtube kind of class of of funding i think i think that that has expanded the possibility space in the world but even then i think there is this more thoughtful nerd space thing that could exist that still it's 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 happening it's in progress like five years ago i feel like it was in a less you know it's with each passing year, it's it's coalescing and it's becoming more whatever it is. You know, like Vibe Camp is happening now. Like 400 people are going to show up. Who knows what conversations they're going to have, what they're going to learn from each other, who's going to find a startup co-founder, what they're going to do. I don't know. But like, it, it could be cool, right? And it's like, these things have snowballed over time. And I'm like, I'm always obsessed with a thousand people who should be here, but are not. Like, who are the next 4,000 people who should be at a place like Vibe Camp, but they don't even know about any of this? And how do we reach them? And how do we encourage them to challenge each other, to raise each other's aspirations to, you know, what interesting work, you know, who's a scholar about something, who's a historian, who's a, who knows stuff that everyone else should know that we don't know about, right? And, and when you kind of encourage all these people to make stuff, to share stuff, and there may be opportunities that we don't even know about yet. So, you know, if you, if you take like the Sony story, Sony started out as a radio repair shop by two wartime researchers from World War II. So after World War II ended, uh, two guys who knew each other from like their research departments they started a radio repair shop because they wanted to just have a place to work and make a living in post-war Japan and it was like uh, for a decade that's what they were doing and they were like screwing around a little bit they tried making like electric rice cooker it was horrible it didn't work and like they're just repairing radios and stuff and then in 1955 I think about a decade later something like around that kind of several years later the transistor was invented and none of them would have known that when they started the radio repair shop that the transistor was going to be invented. But the moment the transistor was invented, they, they had the background knowledge and they were the tinkering expertise to be like, holy shit, we can make... So back then, radios were huge, right? And they're like, we could make a tiny portable radio. And they did. So they made the TR-55 and that like, you know, was a like, phenomenal product and it put Sony on the map and then they went on to make you know, the... the TV and then the Walkman and then PlayStation. Like Sony is now a huge thing, but it started out with a bunch of nerds just screwing around, <laughs> just trying to make a living repairing stuff. And they did not know that they were going to be in the right place at the right time for a tremendous opportunity to fall in their lap. <laughs> and similarly, I do not know what tremendous opportunities are going to fall in our lap in the next 5, 10, 20 years. But I do know that I'm going to be... I'm going to be very, very well positioned to adapt very, very quickly to move fast and, and seize the opportunity. And people who are like more qualified than me, more skilled, more experienced, blah, 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 they will be tied up in their jobs and they'll be tied up in their, mm. you know, academia or whatever it is. And they just can't respond fast enough to, to do whatever is exciting and compare. And I mean, you know, it's not, not, not to like make it like a zero sum competitive thing, but like there's just, there's just, and sometimes some of these opportunities like, if there isn't a right group of people to receive it, it might just not happen. It might not materialize at all, right? So it's really about getting people in, into, into configurations that allow them to, to germinate great ideas and to nourish and encourage great ideas and just, just make awesome stuff hmm. at, in, any, in any dimension, right? In any sense. And, you know, people say things like... A, attention is scarce i don't think that's true you know i think attention is scarce when like nothing interesting is happening but like you know there, i remember there's a period of time where i think like game of thrones and breaking bad were both on tv at the same time and they were both this was before the final seasons and so people were like watching 
you know, they would watch Game of Thrones and they watch Breaking Bad at the same time, if I remember correctly. So it's like people will expand the amount of attention they have if the stuff is really, really good. It's just that this, you know, once in a while, like there's a tremendous blog post that comes out and like everybody drops everything to read it, right? And that's, why is that not like every weekend? You know, it, it's, uh-huh. just, it's just the, the level of quality that we assume is kind of, we, we just assume that, oh, there's, there's like one Elon Musk and there's one Jeff Bezos and there's like one, you know, whatever. Like, why isn't there a thousand of them? And, and not necessarily in the domain of like spaceships and, and, and that, but like, why not a thousand of these people in different, different domains, you know, doing tremendous things? Like, I don't believe that there's an upper limit to how many such people we could have, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, may, maybe the limit is like 100 million or something. Like, who cares? Like, we have like a dozen and we could have hundreds, thousands, mm. right? Let, let's, let's get to 10,000 and see, and, you know, let, let our descendants accuse us of not being ambitious enough. So I, <laughs> I, I, could, I can live with that, right? If, if, we, if we get a thousand more kind of high agency people to, and, and you know, it start, the, the first domino is love and curiosity, right? So it really starts with working on yourself, going through, doing the introspect stuff, you know, kind of like resolving your personal issues. Like, it seems so trivial, but it really, it's all connected all the way through. And yeah, you know, it's, it's hype, you know, it's exciting to be alive knowing that there are amazing friends that we haven't, we just haven't met yet. We don't know each other yet, but they exist for sure. Because it's eight, the 7 billion people on earth, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're going to find each other. It's going to be amazing. I and you know, I just can't wait. Hmm. And you're writing on scenes, you, like there was a thread you wrote a while ago about Erasmus, and then you were like linking mm-hmm. to a few other people, I think, yeah. uh, like Coleridge, Planck, Gertrude Stein. I'm curious, like, what, what would you say that those people have in common and how are you trying to follow their example now? I would say, you know, they all, so all these scene managers, right, or Friendly Ambitious Nerds, they all had an appreciation for the capability and capacity of other people. And hmm. they, they sought to encourage other people and introduce people to each other. And they, I think they all had a, and it's like, yeah, I look at those people from history and I look around me now and it, it's kind of lonely. I feel like not many people like really get it all the way through the way I feel like I do. Or, you know, maybe, maybe I don't fully get it either, but I feel like my, my, my sense of this is more, you know, it goes into my heart. It really goes all the way through and comes out the other side. Like, uh, and, and I mean, there are some people who write about scenes and stuff on, on Twitter, for example, and, and I'm glad that they exist so that I'm not crazy and alone. But uh, yeah, when I read about Erasmus and, you know, like, uh, like even Mersenne, he was like called the post box of Europe. Like what, <laughs> what drives a person to be the post box of Europe? You know, it's like you feel that all these people should be introduced to each other because you, you know in your gut, in your heart, in your mind that when you put excellence next to each other, they challenge each other and drive each other to new heights. And that's a public good for everyone involved, right? Like, so if you can introduce John Lennon to Paul McCartney, that's mm. like the best thing you've done in your life, basically, mm. right? Like you just, you've, you've raised aspirations for generations, right? And, and what if you could make a hundred introductions like that? Like, holy crap. And, and you know, a, a person who kind of did some, a person who kind of lived like that was like Quincy Jones. He's still alive. And like, if you look at Quincy Jones's career, it's like he discovered Oprah, you know, he worked on, on Michael Jackson and Frank Sinatra. And like, we just take for granted that all these excellent musicians existed. Like mm. we could, well, there's no reason that we have all of them. You know, we mm. could, the world could be a Michael Jackson poorer, a, a Frank Sinatra poorer, and it would be a poorer world. You know, it's mm. like people say things like, oh, you know, if not for this artist, we'll just love another. I, I don't think that's true. I, I think it's just that we almost don't want to believe that there's incredible talent that we just don't know about. It doesn't make sense that there's only one Beyonce that should be a dozen. You know, there's just there's all, there's all these people who just didn't get to meet Quincy Jones and didn't get to meet other people like that to challenge and nourish and support them on their trajectory, right? And so I feel like Erasmus understood that. I think Max Planck definitely understood that. Like, you know, he's introducing all these... Like, it's wild. Like, science was progressing so rapidly. And I guess, okay, part of it is kind of he was in the right place at the right time. Like physics was blowing up and there's like new innovation, like, like physics was opening up as a, as a field. And I don't know the specifics, but like, you know, innovation is happening. So people were like super excited and getting involved. But, you know, I can't help but notice that while that was happening, I mean, I guess you could be kind of chicken or egg about it and be like, well, maybe if a field is really exciting, then there will be a scene manager to try and manage the scene around that exciting field. Um, I, I can see how it could go both ways. But like, so with Gertrude Steen's example, for example, so she was in, in Paris in like the 20s or so. And she was like, intrig- like Picasso wasn't as famous before he met her. You know, he mm. wasn't as valuable before he met her. Mm. And so she, I wouldn't say she entirely made Picasso, but, 
you know, she leveled him up and she introduced people to him and like just, and you know, like, so Picasso was not advancing physics, you know, like, so it's not so, so like physics might be, there might be some hard science limit to it, but like, I'm pretty sure if Gertrude Stein was still around today, she would be hosting amazing parties and the, the artists and cool people who would surround her would be extremely valuable. And like, so Andy Warhol did that with his factory. And it's just, it just takes someone with that vision to care and, and I guess the inclination to care enough about other people and to admire and respect their work and to want to celebrate them and to kind of be like a bit of a manager, but not be too domineering and not be too in control, kind of being willing to let like just just want to see awesome shit happen and yeah i guess that that dimensionality that sort of that oblique perspective is pretty rare but yeah i would say that you know like that's what they have in common like they all just just have the sense of adjacent possible excellence and how to nourish it and cultivate it and uh yeah, so I, I try to do the same by introducing cool people to each other, you know, encouraging people all the time, challenging people to, to do better, right? And I, I would say I, I still haven't really gotten started. I'm like 32, you know, mm-hmm. I'm still figuring shit out. I'm still doing my own thing. Like, uh, I, I do think it's important that a scene manager should at least be a competent member of the scene. Uh, there was one guy, I have this list, but I'm not sure. Like, so Mersenne, yeah, he, he's the, the post box of Europe. He was... He was a mathematician. There's like a number named after him, like Mersenne's number. But he, he wasn't like a, you know, like A++++ mathematician. He was like maybe a B plus or A minus mathematician. But he associated, everyone around him was A plus and he made them A++. You know, and that's, mm. it's, 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 it takes, you know, it's, it's a, it takes an interesting mix of like what some people will perceive as arrogance and what is, in my opinion, a genuine humility in mm. that, you know, you know your own limits. You know that you're not, you know, I know that I'm not Prince and I'll never be Prince. I'm not Beyonce. I'll never be Beyonce. I'm, I'm never going to be, you know, that particular tier of great. And I don't aspire to be, you know, I just aspire to be good enough in the domain that I care about. And then I want to, you know, interface with excellence and help the world see what that excellence can achieve. And very often you start investigating. I'm still studying this stuff, but like, you know, like Da Vinci, I don't think he was appreciated all that much during his lifetime like i think it was really so like after he died i believe like vasari wrote about like great painters and artists of italy or or whatever and he was praising da vinci and i think he helped italy see that da vinci was a national treasure right and i don't know if i might be wrong about that so maybe somebody will correct me in the comments so i need to do more reading but it seems to me that there are people who kind of you know, people seldom know how to value like tremendous excellence when it's in front of them. Like, so when uh, the guy who, who who came up with penicillin, uh, what's his name? Jesus. Pas- Pasteur, Louis, Louis Pasteur. No, <laughs> sorry. That was, that was different. That's, that's, that's not penicillin. This is, this is uh, Alexander Fleming. So Fleming <laughs> was the one who came up with penicillin. Pasteur was pasteurized milk afterwards and I don't know what else he did. But Fleming, so Fleming figured out how to punch the, the phrase that I use in my mind that sticks with me is that he, you know, the four horse, the four deadly horsemen of, of man is like what war, pestilence, uh, famine and something else. And like Fleming punched pestilence in the dick for all of mankind. Like he really, you know, like you know, until Fleming, so, you know, how I knew about this was that Montaigne who was like wealthy and smart and wonderful, like lovely guy, presumably, I assume, you know, he, he's, he seems like one of us. It's like a ambitious, friendly, ambitious nerd, kind, wise, everything rich, but he died of like peritonsillar abscess. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is that? Like who, nobody dies of that. Like, well, why have I never heard of it? Turns out it's like a, it's like a mouth infection. Huh. And he didn't need money. No amount of money could have saved him. He just needed like antibiotics. Like anybody with yeah. antibiotics today, you try it, you do it one, one round of it and you're fine. Like you don't even need to like go to the doctor or anything. Like, you know, you don't need to stay in the hospital. And so like Montaigne needed Alexander Fleming and, and penicillin and antibiotics to, to, he could have been alive for like 20 more years for all we know, right? So it's tragic. But mm. yeah, you know, when Fleming presented his findings to like the scientific establishment at the time, like they had no comment. He's like, any questions? And they're like, no. Like, <laughs> like they were just presented with basically the greatest like advance in medicine in human history. Hmm. And they didn't know what they were looking at. They're like, oh, you you have something and it kills <laughs> something. Like, because they didn't understand the significance of what they did, of what uh Fleming had just done. It was just inconceivable. It's like it, it was outside the model of what they thought was possible in medicine. And 
you know, it's just like, I, 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 I meditate on that sometimes. I'm like, when you do something truly incredible, people will just stare blankly at you because they won't know what you did because mm. the, the, it's, it's so far removed from, from their concept of what is possible, right? So like, if you have a good idea, people will be like, oh, that's a good idea. It's not bad. It's pretty good. But if you have a great idea, then it's like, it's so far removed from what people's understanding of what a good idea is that one, and they might think it's a bad idea. And the thing is, a great idea and a bad idea may be difficult for people to distinguish between because without the ecosystem around it to explain, to demonstrate to you why it's a great idea, it, it just seems weird. It seems like an alien idea, right? Like, and yeah, that's, that's, that's very humbling. You know, it's like you, you realize that you might do some tremendous like world-changing work and no one might notice or care until after you're dead maybe, right? And so you, if, if that's what you want to do, you have to make your peace with that. And I don't think I have the fortitude to do to to, <laughs> to do that. First of all, it's very very unlikely that anybody is capable of doing it. You'll probably most likely fail. And even if you succeed, you may not be appreciated for it. So I I I'm kind of you know I like to be appreciated. You know? So mm. I would like to be good at teaching people to appreciate things. So I I think it's likelier that someone else is going to be Losef, right? The LED guy that I mentioned, someone else is going to be Fleming. There may be a Fleming somewhere right now that we don't know about, right? I'm going to try and find them and I'm going to get the world to appreciate them. And, mm. you know, that's like a win-win. I get to be appreciated as the guy that introduced the next Fleming to some of the world. And, you know, that's not nearly as cool as actually discovering penicillin. But, you know, in the end, it's all, it's all good for everyone. So, you know, we get to preserve the next great intellectual for another 20 years or something mm. like that. I don't know how it'll mm. play out, but everyone wins, right? So you just find what you're strong at and what you enjoy and, and lead into that. Mm. I want to come back to the bit about introductions, like, like those historical figures all made introductions between people. And that's definitely something that you do and are trying to do. And um, mm -hmm. I almost have the sense, like I've had the sense for a while of like, uh, um, Oh, like some point in the future, three, four years from now, eight months from now, I don't know when, like Visa is going to be like, oh, you should really talk to this person. I'll just get a DM. Oh, I don't sure. know. You know, it's yeah. like, that's coming. I do that the all the time. Yeah, yeah. I do that all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. And um, like, I have the sense that like, when you're in a highly connected network, like pretty much anyone, like if you connected them, they could you know, like have a good conversation and enjoy each other, like become friends. Yeah. It's good. But like, what in your mind distinguishes like, oh, this is the introduction I definitely need to make. Like this, these are the dots I really need to connect. That's not just like, oh, they're going to enjoy each other. Like how, because that's, that's, that's abundant. But what, what makes a really good introduction in your mind? That's an interesting question. I think usually, um, I mean, I think everybody has some like narrow domain that they care a lot about. And while a lot of people in our scene have like, broad connections right about about like general things the thing that makes me make a specific introduction is when two people have complementary narrow interests right so like uh i remember so there's this guy john kiyosaku i think he's not he's he deactivated his twitter account at some point but like uh we have this other guy uh i can, I can never remember names i remember handles but like um the guy who's very into like like christopher L not just Christopher Alexander, but like Alice Dare. Um, I would have to open up Twitter to type his name out. Suddenly my brain is drawing a blank. The guy who, um, yeah, the guy who's based in Latvia. Yeah, uh, Mikhail. Kid. Yes, Mikhail. M Mikhail. Yeah. So I introduced John to Mikhail because they both had like, just not not only similar interests, but like a similar pattern. So like Mikhail. So like John had like he was like a monk in some. Thing, I think or he had like some training in some specific thing and like he was asking a question that Mikale has an answer to and it's just it's like it's, there, there are certain there are certain connections it's it's I, I don't know if I can reduce it to like a, a formula because it's kind of vibes I guess it's just the sense that the pet like you know each person is a kind of pattern in space-time sort of right there each person is a kind of melody and it's kind of like playing two melodies at the same time right like in, in music like if you, if you do that and when when you have a counter melody that you know, there's like if you have two two melodies in the same key, it'll always work, right? So it's so what you're describing as as like friendly abundance. Like any two people in the same key, it'll sound nice together, you know. But you don't just want it to sound nice. You want you want the 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 connection and the interplay to be like surprising. You want it to be like unexpected in some way, like refreshing in some way, um, deeply valuable in some way, right? So like if if somebody's looking for 
an answer to some question in some domain and it turns out that someone else is like a deep expert in in that domain but it's like slightly different like those those are like the beautiful connections to make or uh, you know sometimes the easy thing is if like someone's moving to a different city or something and it's like someone who's similar enough and in the same city like that's that's a huge obvious connection to make but that's because so that they can meet in person and find if there's any closer connection but in terms of like purely in terms of ideas i i might almost think of it maybe maybe i sometimes even think of it as like introducing individual tweets to other tweets right mm. so it's like you know it, rather than think of the totality of a person like th- you wrote this tweet this person wrote that tweet that's kind of the same thing but from a different angle and it's complementary like oh you know like, i might just say check out this this thing it's the kind of saying the same thing and that's sort of a semi introduction but you know but they it's up to them if they want to follow up on it mm-hmm. but like uh actually let me just search for this you know because I, I know what i can search for i can search for you will enjoy each other is the phrase that i like to use so from me enjoy each other colon colon so let's see who, oh, why is it not i sort my latest enjoy each other you can search bricks sometimes uh yeah okay so this is cool um i told rachel and gretchen so rachel is an economist and gretchen is a linguist mm. and i said are you all mutuals in case you're not i kind of think of rachel as economist gretchen and i think of gretchen as linguist rachel like your next yeah. door neighbors in my brain and they both followed each other and they said it's an intriguing endorsement and that um so gretchen said that's an intriguing endorsement i followed and rachel said my thoughts exactly so i see your point and it's like what do they have in common like they, so they have completely different backgrounds but i think they have a same kind of constructive vibe and i thought what would interest them is that while they have similar vibes they are both highly specialized in different domains so it's like like um gretchen is a linguist and rachel is an economist and both of them would definitely be curious to be like what if i had lived a different life mm. right like what if i had specialized in this instead of that and like when you can say to someone this person is like you but they are in a different domain mm-hmm. like oh my god you want to know everything about that person because like how would i have turned out differently if i had gone into a different domain right mm-hmm. and and then having introduced them i'm like i'm trying to think of other people who fit into this sphere and then i have like i think erica and isabella would also they're also smart kind thoughtful academics and they have like a bit of older sister mom energy mm-hmm. um and yeah so erica's like uh she's a media historian and Isabella is like a developmental psychologist so they each do different things and i introduce all four of them to each other they all follow each other now <laughs> um, oh my god like that you know they might do some if they ever do anything together like that could be one of my like crowning achievements like four mm. of the coolest academics i know mm. in different domains and then, and then i introduce one of them to a comedian it's like oh wow and they all they all just have similar ish vibes mm. and they're all in very different domains so it's like here's a person with similar vibes in a different domain and like that's very easy to to make an introduction for let me see what else i have oh like, yeah i've introduced like two different authors who like just just give me similar vibes and um who else you're in yeah hey ronan you're also in la at the same time as brian i think you enjoy each other you're both kind of magical trickster types location stuff is is easy mm mm-hmm. Uh, let's see who, who else. Uh, I think Devin. Yeah, people with similar aesthetics from different backgrounds. I think it's an interesting like so just like fashion even right? they have the same fashion sense but they are, and they're both my friends and they're from different countries. Hmm. Like what's up with that? You know, uh-huh. and then they they get to explore each other's approach and so it's like when you can when you make an introduction. So I make an introduction when I'm convinced that. Not only would you have a nice conversation, it would like like a friendly conversation, but I'm very sure that exploring some point of contact would be very rich and evocative, and like you would have like, oh my god, we're gonna talk more about this, we're gonna talk more about that, and sometimes I just get a vibe. I get a like having I've been making like hundreds of intro- in- introductions over the years, and so like over time I kind of get a sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's nice to hear about that because I feel like especially at the scale that you're operating at, like, I, it actually reminds me, there, there's an experience I've had, like, I think um, maybe like eight months ago, you were following like 1500 people and now you're about to hit 2000. I feel like it happens to me every week where I come across some new account I've not seen before and there have like 10 followers and it's like Visa and like five other people, you know, it's like, oh, Visa already found them. And it's like, I, at the scale that you're operating at, like um, people might even be connected or adjacent, but they might not see what you're seeing at that sort of like, 
vantage point. So it's kind of neat hmm. to hear how you think about those introductions. Yeah. And I, I think people don't, re like some people don't believe, like it's, I'm kind of obsessive about this. Like I'm just very, very passionate about knowing people and understanding what they care about. And like, you know, um, just, I, I will listen. If, if I see someone on the timeline all the time and they are on a podcast, I will listen to the podcast just to get to know them better. Just so that when I read the tweets, I, I have some context. Right. Mm -hmm. And like people, not a lot of people do that, you know? So it's like, sometimes I feel like a little bit of a, like, I wouldn't say creep, but like I end up knowing things about people that's like, it's not private information. They've tweeted about it. Like they've replied to somebody else about it, but like, and then I paid attention and I noticed like sometimes mm. people, people like, disclose very very intimate and and uh difficult painful personal information and i just know and it's like should i bring it up you know I, it's it's rude to bring it up so i might i might post about it on my alt for example which is locked and private so that like some of my close friends can get some context about what's happening but like mm -hmm. it would be rude to kind of resurface it but i just i just know like i have the burden of knowledge of knowing a lot about people and um i mean it's it's you know it goes back to what i was saying earlier about like um desiring Con being of consequence right mattering in some way and like like knowing people's stories is a precious you know it's a it's a responsibility it's a it's a gift and it's something to be treated with with reverence because people's stories are very important to them. Hmm. Hmm. well we've covered a bunch of territory today coming out of your book and uh, mm -hmm. you know going all the way up to like scenes and where things are going and uh is there anything that's sort of nearby any of the things we've talked about that you'd like to say more about or talk more about I mean, I guess my, you know, my main thing right now is that uh, I'm very proud of my book. So check mm -hmm. it out, mm -hmm. introspect, and I am available for consulting, for marketing consulting. So DM me and uh, yeah, you know, like if you have any questions, like whoever's watching this or listening to this, well, I guess if they're listening to this, they can't leave comments, but like you post these things to YouTube, right? Yeah, it's both YouTube and uh, audio. So people. Yeah. So you, if, if y'all leave comments on YouTube, I'll check it out and I'll try and, and try to reply. So I'm, I'm like, I try to reply to as many things as I can, as much mm -hmm. as I can. You know, it's just the, the joy of my life. Uh, what else? I think we've covered it all pretty much. You know, you know I, I don't know. There, there, may, there may be, I would be curious what you would ask me, you know, like not, maybe not today, but like, having covered almost everything like what mm -hmm. what would you be curious about next once you've like rested and thought about it and uh -huh. oh, i haven't asked visa that like mm -hmm. i'm always curious to go see what what we haven't covered yeah yeah there's so i mean i have a list uh that i've been building since last time of like it's an oh. ever-growing list of questions so I, I think like i have a sense of um where we're going and more things will We'll cover in the future. I, I think one thing I want to get to at some point. I think I think this will be like a whole conversation itself. But it's kind of you have a few tweets about like alternate visualization structures for information and like Visa's graph and BRICS hypothesis, like VCs uh, <laughs> and stuff. I feel like that would be a really interesting thing to talk about and and something that makes more sense from the vantage of all the other things. So. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't have expected that you would be curious about that. I mean, I mean, it's it's not it's not like shocking but like it's just it's it's an interesting uh like dimension to your to your you know it's just if like nobody's i don't know if anybody's asked me about that stuff before like i mean people have asked me on twitter but i don't think anybody's asked me about it on a podcast before i guess it seems like a very uh it's pretty I mean, so buried in there but i think it's pretty central yeah. to it's i mean it's buried and it's also me. it's also very uh it's kind of technical ish like mm -hmm. it's it's a strange i've never thought about discussing it um in in text or in in like it's a very it's a very let me show you let me draw it out for you kind of thing right like mm -hmm. you need the visuals i think to really mm. i mean it can be done i'm sure but like yeah, anyway that's interesting yeah i think i think um there's a lot of, there's a lot of connections between all of the things and i want to like build up to having the perspective to be able to ask about some of the more fundamental stuff so yeah let's definitely do that conversation in the future and thanks for nice. thanks for talking with me today visa that's it thank you for having me <laughs> great